Oh, there we go. Very good. Go to save changes. Hey, everybody! Welcome to the live stream. We have Dean back again, two weeks in a row. <laughs> yeah. Uh, school is out. School is out. So now he's a free man, can do whatever he wants. For those of you that don't know, Dean teaches culinary school to high school kids. High school kids. Yep. Yeah. Juniors and seniors. Yeah, he does that all year long and then plays fish in his spare time. So the goal today is to answer kind of as many questions as we can and not necessarily have a topic. We've been doing the topics quite often. We have a, We had a topic in mind, but... I don't know that we were going to do it justice tonight, so I want to no. save it to do yeah. it correctly. I was in a time we, rush. Well, we thought about it, and the more we thought about it, it might just be a video on its own. Yeah, so, so. going with Q&A then. So, so it be a surprise. Yeah. And I did, do, I did do my energy drink. <laughs> oh, this way, right? Right. So you guys aren't supposed to tell me that I can't do that. <laughs> I think wait, as candle. long as you're older than them, you get to do whatever you want. That's right. That, you know, I mean, yeah. So no, King Lee is in town, but he is uh, out clamming with Jimmy. So awesome. Everyone thought it was going to be King Lee tonight. There That's, you go, yeah. Who also has a YouTube channel. I did too. You know? <laughs> they, they might crash in, who knows? That'd be fun. Jimmy could show up at any time. So. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah. Okay, we're just gonna, I'm going to start reading questions. Okay. And I find that's the best way to get into it. Otherwise, we wait for the perfect one. Right. Uh, would you run a filter in a quarantine tank during the week of quarantine? I would have a sponge filter in it that's already been, already been cycled. Yep. Um, I think that's reasonable. And, and you may kill it with the meds, but you got to have something in there. And the air is not going to hurt anything. I, for me, I mean, I, mean, I have air, to have air in everything, but especially right, with meds. Right. You have to have the air in there. Yeah. I, I mean, some of them will actually even foam up on the surface, right? Right. That's right. so like Prozzi Pro and that kind of stuff. Right. I. I, I always get torn apart with the scientific terms because I, I know what I'm trying to say, but I can't say it correctly. Like but I name. feel like uh, it's not refraction, but the fractionation of the fractionation. water. Yeah. Basically, when you add in Prozzi Pro, it changes viscosity of water and that type of thing. So you're going to get a lot more bubbles, but it also inhibits a little bit gill function on fish and that kind of stuff. Yes. And so just yeah. by aerating... We're alleviating that a little bit and making sure we weren't already possibly harming the fish. Yeah, and basically. really where people run into problems, I feel like, is when you're doing meds, a lot of times the meds call for a water change. Right. And when you use something like Prime, Prime uses up a bunch of oxygen when you take chlorine or chloramine right. and turn it into something non-toxic. And so if you had a tank that didn't have a filter and you do a water change, because a lot of times that's what you think, right? Like I don't have a filter, but I do a lot of water changes. Right. Well, you're actually right. going to run into problems where you don't have enough oxygen, and so you get all that stress. Meanwhile, quarantine a fish, we know it's already brand new to your system, so it's getting right. used to new water, and it probably got shipped to a store or at least brought home, and so you start adding all these factors on, and, uh, yeah, it's a bad time. So Yeah, I think so. And, well, plus, you know, if you're really concerned about that, take a couple five-gallon buckets and age the water. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we meaning me and Corey are pretty lucky that we have so little chlorine in the water. A lot of times we don't even worry about it. Truth be told, a lot of my auto water change system has carbon block filter, but I don't really change them that often me because too. when I go to test the water, you don't find it. It's, I, I basically can't register it. I and can't because either. I'm doing like 10% water changes all the time, uh, I can't register it. That being said, if I do like a 50% water change on the 800 gallon because of a med or something, or koi pond, I will do it out of fear, not out of needing to. I agree. Yeah. 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 When so. you're doing something really major like that, um, it, yeah, I'll add prime or ultimate, whatever yeah. I happen to have. At um, the moment, I use the, uh, the Fritz Complete just because it has a squeezy top, but it's, yep. it's basically, you know, I'm sure lawyers are yelling at me right now, but it's essentially prime. It's so close. It's, it smells it's the same. It's pretty much all the same stuff. Yeah. It takes the chlorine out. Some of them have some aloe in there for the fish also. I did ask, so I, when I was thinking about having my own dechlorinator made for aquarium co-op, I did ask some chemical companies if we could add some scents in there because that's one of the number, my job I feel like is what are people's complaints and then can I fix that? Right. And so one of the complaints is dechlorinator smells horrible. <laughs> it does. And it, it, it was real obvious once someone with, you know, there was a chemist started talking to me, he's like, 
The whole point of a dechlorinator is to break down chemical bonds. The minute you put something like vanilla or orange in there, it's just going to break down that chemical right. bond. Right. He's like, by the time yeah. we're breaking down bleach, for sure we're breaking down these good right. smelling have things. To be. You have to and be. so I was like, oh, I see why no one's ever done yeah. that then. So yeah. that, that made a lot of sense to me. But yeah. Someone said, I can't wait to see you speak in Sacramento. When are you speaking in Sacramento? Uh, July 6th, I believe it is. July 6th, so about a month away. And about you do another one, right? Back to back. July 5th in San Francisco, July 6th in Sacramento. So if you're so, in California, now's that time to make that drive. It is the day after 4th of July. You're 4th crazy. of July, but they said they don't, create, they don't celebrate that down there. <laughs> so Yeah, but you we'll might see. up here. I probably will. You're going to be on an airplane on the yeah. 4th of July, essentially? Uh, I think I'll go the morning of the 5th. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All righty. So that's what we got with that. Will mixing cherry shrimp colors cause the children to be brown? Eventually, I think. So I agree, but I also agree that without mixing, they'll turn brown also. Like, I eventually, think it's the same. It's going gonna, it's gonna to do that eventually, no matter what. Yeah. Without culling ones that you don't like the look of, it's going to revert back to nature or natural color. Right. It might take five years but you know i have to bite my tongue or bite my lip a lot when i travel the world and look at people's cherry shrimp because right. a lot of them they're like look we have cherry shrimp we make so many and i'm like yeah, yeah. but those are like cherry shrimp from like 2000 like they're not right. nearly as red as they right. kind of can be right. maybe not should be but you know there is definitely a lot of grades that go on and a lot of times in other you know, states or countries, they haven't seen really, really nice cherry shrimp. Right. And so it's just like, yeah, it's a red shrimp. Like, true, that is yeah. fair. Um, but naturally, you give birth to thousands of shrimp. Some are going to come out kind of different color. That's how we got all these colors. And if we don't remove that, it becomes, I don't think they ever go back to brown, but they can get mostly clear and like spotty red. Spotty, yeah. I, they will get, people look at that as brown though. Yeah. And I mean, I have those, uh, the Bloody Mary shrimp. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting some, what appears to me, Blue Dream shrimp. Babies. Yeah. And if I don't take those out, they're going to infect, infect the rest. Yeah. And, and it'll just, the longer you let something go, the longer it might sway yeah. towards it. That yeah. being said, we probably don't know enough about that blue genetic to be like, is it even going to repeat? Like maybe right. that just throws that and then it doesn't repeat. Like there's a lot going on. With genetics, with everything, not just shrimp, but right, right. yeah. So yeah. He's got a thirty-gallon guppy tank. What all should I put in there? No, also, I didn't see any. oh, it does oh, say good. guppies. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So also, my first-time customer, I ordered the Zis filter. Can't wait for it to be here. So they've got guppies, and they've got a Zis filter. I don't know if they're asking like what other like, equipment or what other fish. Um, Fish-wise. My recommendation would be like one placostomus, like a bristle nose, and nothing else. So yep. you can maximize the guppies. guppy production, but that's my yep. my MO. Yeah. As far as equipment goes. Is it just the Zis filter or is there something else? I mean I mean I'm sure there's an air pump already. Probably like that would make sense. Yeah. Uh lighting. I would just go with something like a stingray, some low light. Scenario. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the net not be super bright. Yeah. And lately I've been thinking about how I kind of want to get back into like actinic lighting and stuff. Just because I have cichlids and I'm like, yeah. oh, they look so good. Yeah. But then I like growing plants, so I'm torn. I've been, I've been thinking about it lately. Do I want to expand lighting options we sell? Because unfortunately, whatever I use, people will want to buy. Really whether, buy. It, yeah. whether it's a good decision or not, people are like, well, he's using it. I should use it. And so it's like, well, you know, don't always do what I do because it's not a good idea always. Right. Here we go. This is a good one. What do you got? Which one? The bad idea. The bad idea one? <laughs> is it a bad idea or a good idea to dump about half an ounce, do one ounce of live black runs into a tank to cultivate and feed fish? Okay, so. I think we're divided on this issue. We are. Yeah. So we just saw this fish farm video, right? Mm -hmm. No live foods. And did you see the health of those fish? You saw it in person. Yes, they were very healthy. Um, I... I am an anti-black person person. Uh, black worm person. Black worm yes. person, yeah. <laughs> uh, because I have had major problems in the past from that. Um, was it always actually black worms or 
back in the day, like 700 years ago, was it Tubifex worms causing most of the problems? It, it was black your... worms. I never, okay. I never did use Tubifex worms. Okay. Um, they were, they were. Tubifex worms are bad news. Are bad no matter what. Yeah. And they're actually grown in the same water, you know, and, and, you know, I know there's black worm companies out there. They're going to hate me for saying this, but they all grow them in sewer water, you know. Um, does that harbor diseases that can transfer to fish? Probably. However, I would say if you really are a worm person, grow red wigglers mm -hmm. or white worms. Um, those are both non-aquatic, and I don't believe they would transfer anything to your fish. Fish that eat worms generally eat off the bottom, and yeah. that is generally where any of the parasitic eggs are. So. I think... Like, I think buying black worms all the time is kind of a bad idea, even though we sold them. Like, the m majority of it was like, let's say we got in wild caught fish that were super finicky. Right. The goal yeah. is that's a transition food, not, you know, there, there were plenty of people with like oxalotls that are like, oh, I need my, my weekly oxalotl allowance. And they right. never wanted to transition to anything off of that. And I think that's a bad idea. I think. I think any food can bring disease, even a dry food, because most people let it spoil before they feed it. Before they, yeah, so before they use it all I think up, yeah. anything's got a chance to get stuff sick. Possibly there's like leeches are a higher factor in black worms. That being said, they mostly prey on uh, snails yeah, and leeches, other worms. Leeches won't hurt the fish. So, yeah. you know, but it freaks people out. Yeah. What I do find a lot. And this is from being a hobbyist, you know, not me judging other competing stores. I don't even sell black worms anymore, but a lot of stores would not take care of the worms. No, I agree with that. And or the individuals that take them home. Yeah, you really got to rinse them a them lot. keep them clean, they're going to be a lot better. Yeah. And they, yeah. If, they, if, they, if the water is red, like, at all, like, even just a little bit of pink, that means the store is losing them and they haven't been rinsing them enough. Right. And even if they've rinsed them ten times that day, if there is... That means in an hour they're already starting to turn pink. That means they're right. busy dying. They're dying. And right. so right. we shouldn't be buying them anyway. And most stores don't sell enough to move through them fast enough. And I ran into right. that where, right when I first opened my store. I would buy like a pound in a week, and we'd only sell like half it. And I would end up feeding a lot of it to my store. Right. And then towards the end of us selling black worms, we were going through 20, 30 pounds a week. Right. And it was much easier because they would land. We would rinse them really well, and we'd sell, sell them, them really fast. Yeah. And so that was actually much easier than less worms to keep them healthy. That being said, then California had all the problems with fires and droughts and all that. And so now that was 50% of the reason I stopped carrying black worms was just we couldn't get a regular good supply. And when they would land for us, sometimes they were already kind of dying. Yeah. And then we were eating a lot of money. We were, like Black worms are a no money-making scenario kind of for so. a store anyway. The goal is you come in, buy black worms, and you grab a – a filter or a fish on the way out, and you make your money there. Right. Uh, but when it became, you know, just buying piles of death and constantly being in and out of stock, and customers getting angry, we had a lot of angry customers because they had never transitioned their fish off of them, and now we're killing their fish. They would claim, and it's like, yeah. well, we don't own a magical blackworm farm, so. Yeah, and and you know, well, okay, going back to the question is, I would never dump that many in at a time. Dump what they can eat in, mm -hmm. you know, so feed the tank. Don't just dump them in there to hopefully keep them alive. So I think it depends on the fish. So like if you had a guppy tank and you put an ounce in there, they're going to pick at them and get them right over the next like three or four days or a week or whatever. And you won't have any left. You won't start a culture. But if you had a tank with, let's say, tetras and hatchet fish and stuff that won't really pick through the bottom, you right. could get a culture going there. But then now you have this culture of worms that aren't really edible to the fish are in there. So right. it's kind of a catch-22. Right. Um, I do think there could be value in culturing your own black worms. It's incredibly hard, and there's 50 other species of like food to feed that's easier. It's much easier. Yeah. That's, that's why I don't do it. Yeah. Um, but there are people that do it, and you know, there's people like Ian Fuller that swear by it, that yep. like you can't yep. spawn certain types of corridors without it. I think it comes down to what you've had success with will naturally be what you lean towards. And if you're always getting success with black worms, the result gonna, is what you want to go that way. So yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And so I yeah. think there are ways to get there, which 
you know, some of the Israel farms showed that. And they're they're very cautious about introducing parasites or right. diseases and that kind of stuff. And so I think I don't think it's necessarily that they think a live food is bad. I just don't think they're willing to chance anything coming in. Right. And I can see that there's too much money on the line. Oh, there's thousands. You know, I mean, you imagine millions of to, dollars yeah. that if something wipes it out, you know, that's enough to maybe put the farm out of business or whatever. I mean, even if it wiped out one trough system, mm-hmm. that's that's thousands and thousands of dollars the best way to use live black worms is actually feed it to saltwater fish they live for yes. like 30 seconds to a minute and yeah. almost nothing is transferable that they could bring yeah. in at the same time i do use um freeze-dried black worms mm-hmm. you know and did that possibly pass on a pathogen maybe but i think the risk is lower i i, I feel like the risk has to be lower yeah I, I honestly don't think the risk is that high with live black worms with healthy live black worms. I think it's ninety percent is yeah. that most people buy sick ones without knowing it. Yeah. And it's only because I've touched hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of black worms do I know like how easy it is to pass off a black worm looking healthy even though you know you're losing massive amounts of them or right. you know, like if, if they especially like if a store is going to rinse the worms fresh for you right before they sell them to you, like, oh, then yeah, you know, let me rinse yeah. them. Then you know <laughs> yeah. that they're, yeah, they're that bad. They're you should them. never see anything but absolutely clear water in there. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So I don't – and I know they're useful for, like, they might not transfer disease to oxalotls. I remember way back as a kid – it wasn't even mine. It was my cousin's. He had a newt, and we had to get yes. five black worms for the newts. Yes. And that kind of stuff. Yep. So, Yeah. All right, I think we got some paid questions here. Uh, can I ask what the orange cones I commonly see in breeder tanks are during fish room tours? That was going to be in that, that video we that want was. to make, actually. Yeah. 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 They are they're breeding cones. Uh, they used to be just called discus breeding cones, but they work for any of the uh, vertical spawning cichlids. So angelfish discus. Yep. Um, drop them on their sides. Pleckles will spawn in them. Uh, but that's not what they were made for. I actually used to use bricks, like fire okay. bricks. Fire bricks. Yeah. I, I had access to a, a mason saw, and I would saw the two edges. Okay. Does it does is a slant key then? Um, I don't know that the slant's key. I mean, obviously it's not because the angels in this tank back here right. are completely vertical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the thought is if the slant is there. If the fry are slipping down, uh-huh. the parents will grab them and put them back in the mass. That would make sense. They would kind of roll down a hill yeah. instead of like if it's completely Just drop off. Way, they fall off. Yeah, I can see that. And you maybe. will see some of those out there that have a rim around the bottom. Mm-hmm. That rim is designed yeah. to catch the fry from hitting the bottom of the tank. Um, so yeah, so they're it's a they're a breeding cone. And if you're in an area or a country that can't get them, I've seen a lot of breeders just stack up um, like terracotta pots. Exactly. Yep. And it kind of has too. that little lip, but inherently yep. they yep. kind of recede back a little bit. Um, and, the, I mean, we used to breed just on slates or, you know, pieces mm-hmm. of PVC put in. Uh, the idea with the cone is the fish can't knock it over. Yeah. That, that's the number. We, and they can spawn anywhere around it. So if they're, not, if, they, if they're not spawning from the front, facing away from you, they can actually view what's out there. And figured that the back is safer. my favorite thing they don't make anymore, and that is the uh, Angels Plus made them, and they were like the bent acrylic with the the earth magnet. Yes, they don't make because the earth magnets were too expensive. To, to the outside, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it made it really easy to transfer eggs to a jar or yeah, whatever. Or exactly. Whatever Instead of like having to like, because once this thing's covered in eggs, it's not the easiest thing to grip from like the point. No. You kind of got to get no. in there and like move it, and you got to make sure the jar can handle it. Where this like curved piece of acrylic so it kind of flared out right and you could just take the magnet off and you could Grab set it. it at any height also right. so big tanks wasn't a worry yep. and then you just put it on the side of a jar and, and it had the bent lip at the bottom yeah yeah right right you know they had other ones that used like suction cups and that kind of yeah. crap but it was, like suction cups. but it was expensive for the magnet one but yes. it was really good it was really good but I don't think they were making any money because the magnets just keep going up and up and up in price yeah so and they, they had to be coated Epoxy yeah, coated because otherwise they rust. Right. That's that's my number one question. When everyone's like, well, "Look at this magnet thing. Is it going to rust?" So I've always wondered why. You know, the, you know the orange plastic ones which you saw, orange plastic um, uh, breeding cones. 
I think they were. You saw they were in uh, in the Israel video. Were they plastic though? Yeah, those are plastic. Okay. Yeah. Why has not someone figured out to make a filter and have air come out of the top of the cone? It only makes sense. Try that, somebody. Get back to my me. only thought without <laughs> trying it is maybe if the eggs fall down, it's going to suck them in because I would assume the intake's on the bottom. Sponge would protect that. But I don't think I don't think that you're going to have that many falls. You're not but... going to have that many falls. And if you're gonna if you're gonna take the cone out and hatch them artificially, you're not gonna have any fall. Regardless, it should probably have an air stone in it because even if you move that cone to exactly. a jar, yeah, it's kind of well. well you, I guess you, you want the. Don't you have stagnant water inside it? You would. So um, maybe the key is to like build a base that the so cone that the, sits on, so you could like have the air come on the outside because you got to roll over the eggs. That's the next step, right? That'd be the next step, yeah. So if you could like have it come out the center while it's in the breeding tank. And then you turn a valve and it comes out the outside out the up, when you yeah. move it. And, and it had filtration. I, I tell you why this product doesn't exist. Because only 100 Which cones so sell a year right. anyway. Exactly. So now we've got $100,000 to make back $80 a year. Yeah. All right, what do we got? 36-gallon bow front with an Aqua Sky LED. So that's like the next level down right. from Fluol 3.0. He's got some Eco Complete. Uh, what would you use for aquarium co-op online to make... A good home for 12 pea puffers. Do you sell those um, uh, Java ferns on wood online? Yeah. I would get a couple of those. Those, are, I mean, they're tall. Mm -hmm. They always come in in great shape. Um, I buy them and kill them eventually, but but that's, you know, that's probably because I One day we'll teach you to do plants. No fur. But I would get a couple of those because I think it's going to... First of all, it's easy. It's already on wood. You just take it out, rinse it off, put it in. Done, mm -hmm. right? Um, Equipment-wise? Oh, um, I would do, like, we don't have them right now, but the stick packs. Like, we've oh, got yeah, the yeah. nano twigs. Those are good, too. We yeah. should have those in, like, two more months. We found a yeah. different source, but it's it's on a car. They're being prepped, yeah. and then it has to load a cargo container, and then it has to clear customs. And so if they were on the water right now, we're still 45 days out. So right. I think we're two weeks from hitting the water, which means pea, we're two months out. Pea puffers like wood in the water? It's not that they say they love wood. They yeah. love to be inquisitive. And so just the more stuff they have to swim around and look at, I think, is a good thing. But, you know, treat them like African cichlids in that when you clean in the aquarium, move the decorations around. They love to explore. So He doesn't say what's favorite. Filter or has in there. Uh, maybe you would get one of those little air pumps and an air stone. Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. Yeah. But mostly it's what you like to look at. People all the time go, what would be the best things for this fish? And the reality is the fish just wants clean water. Basically. And then and good, and good food. Somewhere mm -hmm. where it doesn't have to be exposed to the elements. Right. You know, and it's a hiding place, basically. But then it's just like choosing the decor inside your home. Like everyone likes something different. So right. it's like, well, what do you like? Then right. do that. So, yeah. Is there a live bearer that you haven't had yet that you're looking for? Well, I stole the one from here, so. Right. Um, there are live bearers that I have seen on basically different people's channels and stuff. Mm -hmm. That... I feel like would be really cool. I can't remember names of them though. Sure. I'm not a scientific person. Um, Greg Say just had a couple. Um, and I bet you there's ones out there that haven't even been discovered yet. I, uh, for sure there's got to be ones that have never been discovered. Um, but, you know, when it comes to live bears, I almost always come back to guppies. Mm -hmm. um, there's one that, uh, besides guppies, is the... Albino red eye sword tails. The albino red eye red sword tails, I think, are really cool. With the high fin and everything. With the high fin. Yeah. They're not as easy to raise uh, because they are fry eaters. Mm -hmm. um, so how about you? So I've there's not too many libraries I actually haven't kept at this point. Because I okay. as I mean, I've got a stack of library books and that kind right. of stuff. Like I've done a lot. So I think. The one that I want to keep still, but I'm too lazy at this point, would be anableps, which mm -hmm. are the brackish water, four-eyed fish that's four called. Ones, yeah. They're super cool. But I think there's a lot of live bears that should be popular in the hobby 
if people bred them and knew it was going to take five years to make a ton of money. Right. So like right. Tiger Teddies, which is the Elegans Library, it's a nano fish that... It's little. It's yeah. very small. Yeah. It looks super cool. Look up Tiger Teddy Aquarium Fish. Very cool fish. Uh, Mary Widow Library. It's kind of a lesser version of that, but still decently cool. And then I think a lot of the half beaks get a bad rap. Like they get a really bad rap, I think. They will eat stuff that fit in their mouth, but not any more so than a killifish will. And right. yet, killies, will killies sell really well. Right. Right. But all these half beaks are monsters, right? And they will eat their own fry, but that's because they eat stuff that fits in their own mouth. And so that's exactly what killifish do as well. And so they both jump, like, same right. problem. Right. You just need a ton of floating plants, feed them well, and then when you see babies, like, oh, net that out like you would a killifish right. and raise them up. And the colors on some of the, like the Celebes half beak are insane. Whenever you see a good picture, you're like, why haven't I seen that fish in an aquarium store? And from a guy that loves live birds, I can tell you because when I bring them in, they don't sell because they come in this big and people are like, mm. Mm, yeah. And they're expensive because right. they, they're a little bit hard to breed. So they might be like 13 bucks. And in the live bear world, that's a lot of money, it you is, know, yeah. compared to but, just but a But yet people a will plan. pay 40, 50 bucks for a pair of guppies. Right, but usually I maintain that the person willing to spend 50 bucks on guppies wants to breed it for a profit. So right. they already have success with guppies. Now they're thinking, okay, I'm going to breed these I'll this. Yeah. and I'll be able to yeah. do more of my hobby. Yeah. Where when you take a chance on the half beak, most people, it's their first time. Right. And then... So you got to think, okay, I can six of these things. Now I'm into it for like 80 bucks. Okay, I had one jump. And okay, okay they're beating on each other. I didn't have enough floating stuff. And yeah. so they have this bad thing. And then they transfer on like, oh, half beaks, don't touch those. Those things are a nightmare. Right. right. And so, yeah. but I do think they, I know they sell well when you have them really colored up, like the wrestling half beaks and the metallic yeah, ones. I mean, they're, they they're look gorgeous. really good. They're gorgeous, yeah. And that's the problem with a store is like, if I buy them and I sit on them for eight months, and then sell them, they sell in like two days. The problem is that whole eight month, eight month part where I lost money. You haven't, yeah. Because I fed them, them and just got them really healthy. And, them. Right. So, but there are, I think, you know, there's a lot of libraries out there that are just cool. The one that I would like to see more popular as well would be the uh, the, the red picta guppy. That's a really I've cool killed fish those fish. things like five times. And yeah. when I say killed, it means I've kept them long enough that they kind of age out and die. And they eat their fry, and they want really, really hard water, which we don't have, right. which leans towards brackish. And there are some people that can really crank them out, and they look really cool. Yeah. Um, but they're not they're not mass. I've never seen them raised in, in mass, whereas in like a scarlet en endler, I might go, oh, that farm's got 25 million of those. Right. And they'll never touch a pictoguppy. Right. So I don't know if it's genetics are too far gone. I don't know. I don't think we can pull them out of the wild anymore. So it might be... One of those issues. Yeah, they, they, yeah. It, and and I think it's also is there's, is there enough breeders out there that are willing to pick that up and go with it? It has to be more than one person. And there's the chicken and the egg problem of like no one wants this fish because no one knows about it. Right. Yeah. So it's that weird like. Right. Well, right. I would you know and you I get that all the time when I go to the farms. Oh, we just don't raise that. I love that fish, but no one buys it. Right. You know even. Even like uh, Danziger, the farm we went to, they were a discus farm. That's all yeah, they did I was discus. That. And because people weren't paying enough for discus to the amount of work that went into them, they had to switch to all these other things. Right. Their love is still discus. And they have, like we went into their house, there's tons of books have been written about them and that kind of stuff. Nice. And they were doing amazing things. But even then, they're forced to go where the money in the market is. Of course. And so. I mean, they're, they're in business to make make money right and so yeah there could be this like huge national or worldwide campaign to get discus popular again but at the same time who's going to put all that money in when you could just like oh let's make money on these fish right at the right. end of the day most of us don't really care what fish we breed or what fish we even keep we just want you know that that thing to take care of in our house right so yeah this one's going to be for you any tips on keeping betta imbolus i don't think i've ever kept it I haven't really kept it, but I've, I've talked to people that have. Yeah. I would set them up in a 20 long mm -hmm. that gives enough refuge or even a, a 55 if you're going to do a, a group of them mm -hmm. so that you give enough room for refuge to, play, to take place. Um, those types of bettas tend to pick at each other pretty bad. Um, beautiful fish, though. Um, 
I have not bred that one. Uh, I haven't kept it, but uh, it's not far off from like the strawberry bedas and stuff like that. Yeah, I haven't done enough research. Yeah. Where I start when I breed a fish is what are they? What's their temperament? Yeah. If they're like super aggressive, I have no interest. Just because I know they're not going to sell well. I know they're going to be hard to raise. Like, I just so if they're not. Which means they're probably a little bit ornery, and I'm like, oh, I don't really yeah, care yeah. about these guys. It's not that I don't care. It's that you don't. Mm, yeah. Plus, so, plus, there's usually something else that's on your list above that. Yes. You know. So. Well, that's that's it. Is like of all the wild bettas, like wait, I could breed this other one that people do want, Will is buy. colorful, <laughs> isn't super aggressive, right? And I can already buy a captive raised. Okay. Right. Uh, are you a certified scuba diver? I feel like you've done everything, Dean. <laughs> I can't even swim. Oh, all right. <laughs> we go to the Amazon. If I get off the boat, yeah, I better just hope that the alligator gets me before I drown. You know? I'm not certified, but I, I kind of want to get certified just because to do like Lake Tanganyika or Lake Malawi, you have to dive down to see any to, cool stuff. Yeah. But at the moment, I'm applying for uh, life insurance. And so, no, I will never get certified. <laughs> I don't know why. It doesn't seem that It is dangerous. on the application, though. It is. And so it's skydiving, right? Yes. I yes. Don't, I'm not becoming a pilot and right. none of that. And I'm not a certified scuba diver, or have I ever even attempted it yet. I just want them to take me down in one of those mini subs, air-conditioned, 360-degree viewing. That would be happy for me. Truth be told, I just want to dive. Like, I want a submarine with a camera. I don't even need to yeah. go down myself. <laughs> That's true, too. I just want the footage of, like, look right. what it actually looks like. Right. Um, but, you know, I have to... That process of events was like, I'd have to get invited on a trip, then I'd have to go get certified, right. then I could go. Like, right. that's a couple year thing right. that may never pan out. So. Yeah, it's never going to happen for me. Yeah. So, uh, let's see here. A plant light question. Would, what light would you recommend for a 10 gallon that grows plants well, having a hard time finding a quality light that also fits a 10 gallon? I know my recommendation. Would you say a stingray? I would. I would too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's only, so Stingray, when you read about it, you're going to go, this is a low light light. Yeah, but on a 10 gallon, it's high light. Yeah. You know. And assuming it's a normal 10, because lighting, the way it works is every four inches, like away from the substrate you go, it's half as much intensity. Right. So a 10 gallon is only like 12 inches tall. Well, but by the time, you, if you're putting substrate in there, you're talking 10 inches. Yep. And, and that light sits right down on the tank. So it's mm -hmm. right down there. Um, as you know, I've actually gone online and figured out how to put a dimmer on the stingray right. because it's almost too much light. On the small tanks, uh, yeah. And we were just talking about this before the show is don't leave that light on for eight hours a day. You know, give it, give it a rest. In a 10-gallon with the stingray, I think I would do a double light cycle with the rest cycle. Yeah, with the siesta method, yeah. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think I would do that. Yeah. That's something we could do now that you're out of school. Because I won't do it, but I, I can let you do it, right. is you could make a video on how to install a dimmer on a... There on you a, go. We could do that. Because I don't want, I don't want to field all the questions. Two, we're not going to teach you how to do electrical work. Right. You can watch how Dean does it, but we don't want to field the, hey, I ran into, I'm, now I'm getting this dimmer. Will this work? Like, that's right. not... Right. Because it and avoids we, a warranty also. Right. Yeah. As soon as you cut the cord, the warranty is voided. Yeah. But in, I use stingrays in my fish room. I cut all the cords. Yeah. Anybody needs a Stingray uh, power supply that's brand new? <laughs> They'd have to cut their own cord and wire it back in. But... It's easy to do, though. It's just two wires, you know, so. See, you're already uh, getting yourself into trouble. You're going to be fielding I questions know, forever. Know. Tell me again, how do you wire this yeah. up? Yeah. yeah. But the dimmers are available on Amazon now, so. Oh, that's not one step easier. But you have, you have crazy power blocks and yeah, all but, kinds of Yeah, but stuff. we're just talking about one light, the dimmer. Yeah, that, I did one, and then I yeah. was like, "This is going to be a can of yeah, worms." Yeah, it is a can of worms. With the amount oh, wait, of wait, I have to do one service. thing here. Yeah, uh, high candy. <laughs> if I don't do that, you know, I have to do that because. All right. And if she doesn't type high, I'm going to be really upset. We'll but, never get to see it anyway. So oh, okay. Low light for a forty breeder, ultra low light in my fish room. If you go and watch, kind of fish room updates, I ran stingrays for years. You're pretty much running that now, right? That's what I have on my 40 breeders. Uh, I don't do any really, well, actually, I have some highlights on the 75s that are outside of the mm -hmm. fish room. Um, but in the fish room, they're all. We should, um, maybe you'll give me rates. the motivation to actually do stuff. 
Maybe. We should. Yeah, I know. That's the maybe <laughs> part. But I've I've always wanted to show people that. Like, you've been around long enough to know people have been growing plants for a long time. Like, right. Eric and the club have right. been doing it for, like, you know, 30 years at this right. point, right? right? Yep. So, but back then, we only had, like, T12 light bulbs, and we could grow a third of the plants that are on the market right now. And they right. put out so much less light right. than what our current LEDs. But I would love to set up, like, could we even T12s. Buy T12s now? You can still buy T12s, but I think only eight-foot-long ones. Yeah. And Because I, I have them in my old warehouse. Okay. So, but we need to set up a, like a, I guess a testing facility, like if you for will. for all the different ones that right. are starting at the teach one. And well, so, before that, we grew plants with incandescent lights. Right. And so if you could kind of map so, out, like, okay, here's the lumens, or not even lumens, but like the PAR we had the par, yeah. 30 years ago, and we could grow these plants. And here we are, like, you've got 50 times as much, like, I think you'll be okay. Right. Type of deal. Oh, and we didn't have all these high-tech fertilizers, like uh, Easy right. Green and stuff. But I, I'm not convinced that that's actually a good thing because I feel like the people that grew plants 30 years ago really had to know what plants wanted to yeah. get the results. Now, yeah. you can buy some Easy Green and you're like, hey, it's just working. It's but works, you yeah. actually don't know a lot about what the plants are doing and about the structure of the plants. and you know, So you get the results, but I think the average plant hobbyist 30 years ago was a super plant nerd, and the average... Uh, plant person nowadays is more of an aquascaper nerd than right. they are a right. hardcore plant nerd. Because yeah. it used to be I, the only people that were really into plant tanks would be like gardeners, like in their right. home. Like they were just like, I need more seasons to grow stuff. Yeah, they put dirt in the bottom and yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. And they were just, you know, oh, it's cold outside, so I want to do more plants inside. That was right. their thing. And now we've swayed over to it's, you know, very popular. So, yeah. All right, let's grab some more out of the, the normal chat here. Oh, we have a very important question. Why isn't an aquarium co-op shirt that says enjoy nature daily on it? It should be a thing. I don't know. That's a good question. And and I had a follow-up question to that. Okay. You know, if we're doing Peru this summer, mm -hmm. I'm going to get a new, probably the, the good one, the good hat. Yeah, the $70 hat that I wear any yeah. chance I can. Cause Can't we get the, the logo on the front of those? Oh, I, well, right? we've got, so I'm not wearing it right now, of course, because I'm bad at my job, but right down the road, there's a local embroidery, embroidery. shop that I already had the logo digitized, Perfect. and they'll basically put it on anything. There we go. So for like $9. I'm going to work on that. It's not cheap when you're doing shirts, because you're like, oh, I bought the shirt, now it's $9, and, yeah. but yeah, we should do that. that and sense. if we take any baseball hats, um... Yours are black right now with red, right? Well, no, I've got the new one. I'm not wearing with it right the green. now, but the green, yeah, yeah it's a lighter. Okay. It's it like green to, and gray. Yeah, it has to be lighter for down there because the bugs are drawn to the black, but not the light. Hmm, so, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, but the Enjoy Nature Daily, there is a whole side of my business that we are not taking advantage of, and that is like the merch side. Like right. from being a YouTuber, social media person, we should be bombarding the crap out of you with like, check out the latest merch, bro, and buy it type right. of thing. Because that's like the right. business model. And I yeah. focus so hard on let's develop an actual product where there's like a need. Like I don't, I honestly don't feel like, oh man, someone needs a shirt. Like there's 4 billion <laughs> yeah. different shirts on the planet. You can get one that works. But yeah. I almost need to hire someone on that's like. The merchandising. Yeah, merchandise, yeah, branding. Yeah, like we do branding. have a, you know, we do have a new uh like murphy caricature thing we got some things in the work on up. or okay. works on that so maybe that'll become part of that but yeah the i'm torn with the enjoy nature daily so part of me i think shirts are like advertising and so i'm like if it doesn't have a i feel like it's a waste and then it's like but the enjoy nature daily that's kind of this cool thing and it would start a conversation it would. and so i have this internal where did struggle you get that? yeah because i Truth be told, I give away way more shirts than we sell. Like, I believe I that. give a lot of shirts yep. away. Yep. Like, I'm like, oh, that. yeah, I have yep. a shirt, you know. Yep. So it needs, like, if I'm giving it away, it has to kind of advertise a little bit. Because otherwise, I'm just literally throwing money away at that point. So, favorite substrate for cichlids? Uh, bare bottom. <laughs> bare bottom. <laughs> I'm, I'm going, truth be told, I ordered... 14 bag, 14 40 pound bags of crushed coral. I'm ripping everything out in my fish room and going all crushed coral with no gravel mixed in. Yeah, just straight up crushed just straight coral. Because I, I know I love live bears. Yep. And 
if I have a tank that needs to be lower pH, I can just crank up the water change. So, and you wouldn't be doing any under gravel filter on it. You're just letting it. Yeah, just a natural yeah. dissolve. Okay. Yeah, which at very at the very beginning, it'll be. Um, it's going to go high, high pH, pH at first, but yeah. but with your water change system, it's going to take. Right that now, down. I'm running too low. Is the problem like on the goldfish tank and that kind of stuff? And I fr like now that I'm so busy in business, I forget like. Wait a second! It's been like a year since I put any crushed coral into that system. I, and then I do test the same it, thing like, oh, in my dang. fish room. I do the same thing in my fish yeah. room. All of a sudden, I'm like, wait, it's too acidic. Yeah. You know. Um, so I'm I'm so. buffering towards my own bias of knowing I'm going to fail doing that. The opposite way, and the fish I tend to want to keep want that anyway. And they're not going to. Yeah, they're not going to be hurt from that. That's that's my tip. If yeah. like if you want to be an ultimate lazy fish keeper like me, just use crushed coral. Yeah. It's like because it. It basically means you'll never run into too acidic water. It's almost impossible. Right, right. You know, there are some corner cases, but if your substrate is all crushed coral, it's dang near impossible to get too acidic of water. Right. So yeah. I, I would say rarely. Get That's it. why I do it out in the ponds, too. Even with all the needles and everything dropping in but and stuff rotting. I think needles are extremely acidic, so you've right. got to have the buffer in there. Yeah, yeah. so that's, but that, it, it'll even buffer against that, even that much stuff rotting and, and that yeah. kind of stuff, so... Uh, what fish are you hoping to find in Peru this time? You know, uh, I don't know about you, but when I go to Peru, I go with a completely open mind. Um, because I don't know exactly what locations we're going to collect in yet. Mm -hmm. we, we might not even know until the day that we actually go out. So A lot of times they ask you in the morning, what are you looking for? What do you guys want to yeah, do? Yeah, they, they will. I mean, uh, you know, I don't want to go for big fish. Because, well, I don't need big fish, you know. Um, big fish are what we eat for dinner. You don't know that yet. Right? I don't know that yet, but <laughs> yes, yeah. I've heard. Big fish we eat for dinner. So um, I just want to find interesting fish. What, I, what we really want to do a lot this time is document the biotopes. Mm -hmm. uh, so we almost want to try to get in the water ahead of catching fish. Yeah. Before the water gets all mucked up, um, I mean the water's not as clear anyway. So once it gets mucked up, it's really going to be hard. So uh, that's kind of more of a goal this time is to try to document some of those biotopes, mm -hmm. um, and then maybe get great photos of the fish that we do catch, whether we bring them back or not. Yeah, that's um, for fish. For me, I have nothing that I'm uh, specifically after. I don't. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm most likely to bring home a big fish, though. Are you? Like if there was like in your stomach the right catfish or something. <laughs> okay, I could see myself pulling something exotic out and being like, "Wow, that'd be pretty cool to have as a pet." What about a stingray? Well, we can't. It's too hard to get them out, and I'm not a big stingray okay. guy, so probably not. Okay. But like, I could I, like I could be tempted to be like my own Paku or something. I could be tempted to be like I literally caught this thing and flew it back, and now it's my pet for the next twenty years. Yeah. Like. It would take a much bigger than an 800 gallon aquarium and all that, but Over that's time, the kind of but, stuff. But, yeah, but you're that's the kind of stuff where I'd be like, oh, how. And I don't even know what it is yet. Yeah. Like, it, I'd don't, have to see don't. it and be like, how cool would it be to be able to, like, I caught this here, it's, I brought it home, I raised it up, it was yeah. this big, and who knew? A good example of that is the lungfish. Yeah. You know, it's like, that's the only one we saw, the only one we caught. And I'm like, okay, I have to take that home. And there's got to be stuff that. I'm not thinking about that comes from the Amazon where I'm like, oh, dang, yeah, I would love yeah. one of those. I mean, to be honest, one of the fish that I would, uh, we can't have them here, I'd love to bring it back, is the red belly piranhas. Yeah. I, I think that would be really cool to have like eight or ten of them. Uh, I don't even think we could get a special permit for that. I think they, yeah, would, just, they I, would just take them away. Yeah. Um, I, is there, I guess there's some fish I feel like I would only keep with a story because, like, without the story, not good enough. There's not like, a point, right? Mm, yeah, I could buy Paku any day, right? I but like, what if, what if you naturally saw an albino version of a fish? Or you'd be like, if, oh man, what maybe about I'd that. Yeah, maybe. You know, uh, and that, cause that's stuff that I kind of get, and then I'll let go. Like, ah, I can do it again later. Yeah, but but if, you if you caught it yourself, exactly. you'd be like, oh, I could never get rid of these, yeah. unless you know, like, yeah. So I, it's like, I mean, a good example is I was just at the store today on the way here. And you guys had a bunch of the little red eye or the monk tetras. Yeah. And my monk tet I mean, yours in the store are, what, inch, inch and a half long? Mine are like three inches long now. And I'm like, 
how did that happen? Is it a different variety? Yeah. They're a deeper body. They're almost a different body shape. Um, but I caught those myself, or we caught them you know, together. And so. I'm sure there's stuff that is... Well, I mean, we've, we've been to Peru together once. Yeah. There are stuff that you're never, ever going to see in a store, and you're like, why isn't that in a store? Exactly. That's the kind of stuff right. you're more likely to bring home, because you're like, wait, right. do people not know this is cool yet? Or does it ship terribly? Or... Like, I'm much more rather to take a, a risk on that than like, but I could just order those. Right. So that's... What about um, if we ran into the situation, I mean, I did last time when I went on the big boat, on the big river, uh, but the Amazon puffers, would you bring back a group of them? Probably not. No? Too common? Yeah. Because okay. uh, I, I, I feel like I'm, I don't know that I necessarily want to keep a tank of Amazon puffers okay. right now, but I know there are things like... Not that we'll be in the right area, but certain plecos where I'd be like, yes. oh, I'd have to, yeah. just because that'd be super cool. Um, we don't actually know what plecos are in the area that we're going to be in yet. Yeah. Um, you kind of get some of those choices, like, do you guys want to explore and maybe catch nothing, or do you want to go over here where we, where know, we know this know. is? Yes, exactly. You know, And so. it's not just mine and your choice. There's six or eight other people on the boat. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's, uh, I, if I ran into pencil fish, I would bring them back. Um, I think the wild. So ones I can are think of something so that I would color. probably bring back: the super big hatchet fish. They've got oh, the ones that are like six, eight, time, yeah. six, eight inches. They are that would rare. be kind of cool enough because they're so rare to ever yeah. see on a list. Yeah. That and in my mind, I'm like, that would mesh right into the 800 gallon. That would, would be a cool fish. And they couldn't get out. Yeah. 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 So like, okay, maybe, but yeah. I don't. I never want to go with intentions because I've done that once before when I went to uh, Florida. For the library convention, I really want to catch Bellasonics, which is the Pike Live Bear, they yeah. call it. And then I didn't catch it, and I was kind of bummed out the whole trip. Right. I'm like, oh man, another place we didn't catch it. You said it was going to be here this time. Yeah, I feel it's just much better to go with, with, with an open mind. You know, um, if you go with expectations, you tend to be disappointed. And if you go with an open mind, you're going to have a great time, and, you know, you'll get more out of the whole trip, I believe. Yeah. Oh, that's a good super chat. John Zim says, don't forget, tomorrow you'll be able to listen to this on the podcast. We will. So the crazy part is, and I, I haven't talked about this for a while, one, John Zim just donated 20 bucks, which is super cool. But what's even cooler is he donates his time. So after this gets goes up tonight, within the next 24 hours, he usually pulls it back down and uploads it to the podcast. He's got oh, all the podcast okay. login because... Cool. Typically, I'm exhausted after a live stream, and then I got to do dinner, and I've got all these things I got to get done. And in years past, all of a sudden, it would take like 14 days for me to upload anything. And so right. he does it, he does it on the regular. And so he, you know, kind of this crowdsourcing thing has made it much easier. So it looks like I'm a better, better businessman sure, than I am. Of course, there you go. You know, and every once in a while, well, you know, he also puts a, a tank in. Uh, at his, I think it's Sun's school at the library. So I'll donate cool. some stuff. If, That's if, cool. I always yeah. say, what do you need? You know, and we can send that that way because it, it's one helps kind of thank him, but it's all going to a school, which makes it a no brainer of like, oh, it's in right. a public library. Of course we can help with that. Right. And right now he's designing a, uh, a very cool kind of multi fasciatus tank for the library. Oh, cool. That doesn't start good. till next year, but still, you know, he no. changes it pretty much every year. So, right. yeah. Right. All right, what do we got? Uh, I've heard conflicting info. Uh-oh. Spotted Congo puffer in a 40 breeder. What do you think? Is that mine? Is that yeah. the type I have? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, easy. I, that's what I say. I yeah. say easy, easy peasy, too. Easy. I, would, I personally would go as small as a 29-gallon. Well, with one. With one, but, you know, Preston would go in a 20. Sure. But he's, a, more, but he's more torpedo. Breeder. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I think, a tw you know, to me, the 29 is that studio apartment, but you walk your dog six times a day, right. and it has a great life. Right. And everything, every, you know, step up above that, you can be lazier on the six walks a day part. Right. And with with those puffers, keep up with your water changes. I think that they love the good water quality. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it the easiest thing for any Aquarius is to say, oh, you know, I can wait till next week to change the water. Yeah. And then, boom, we've got diseases. Uh, you know, it's so much easier just go get the bucket or the hoses or whatever and change the water. I actually like changing water. Like, that's when I rebuild the fish room, 
I'm intentionally not going to rebuild most of it on the auto water change system so, so that I will spend time. Because yeah. if I don't have to change water, then it's like, ah, oh, I'll do that project tomorrow. Right. But if I'm already wet and covered in mold, then all of a sudden I'm like, yeah, I'm going to swap this filter. I'm going to do this thing. Right. But if you're sitting at the computer doing work, like, do I want to break out and do that right now? Like, ah, oh, I'm actually supposed to go do this meeting next. Right. So I'm not going to do that right, right now. So if you make it like a bigger project, it forces me to like, oh, you may as well do that. It's well, even like, you know, for me, it's like even cleaning the sponge filters. As soon as I get in, it's like, okay, I'm going to do this one. Okay, I can do the next one. I can do the next one. It just It just flows. Yeah. But if, like you say, if you're sitting there, you know, you're like, oh, it's easy to put that off. Mm-hmm. So. Okay, so Bear's Faces has bred many Corydoras, but he's unable to breed his Schwarzai Corys, even though they seem interested. Do you have any tips? Have you bred those ones yet? Are you sure they're not breeding and eating the eggs? That's the first thing I'm going to ask. Because a lot of Corys will lay really, really early in the morning. Mm -hmm. And if they happen to be egg eaters, um, the eggs are going disappear, to disappear before you see them. That used to happen when I was doing, um, what are the little micro ones? Uh, has, Abrosis Abrosis. And, yeah, yeah, those ones. Ass, yeah. I would never see the eggs, but you could tell that the females have hmm. dispensed their eggs. Um, so that's one thing is make sure they're not already breeding. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to get out of bed at 5 o'clock every morning. Usually you're going to see a breeding behavior after a, a cool water change. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that I found is they don't always spawn on a hard surface. Right. So um, put a spawning mop like maybe right up against the front glass. And if you can aim a directional filter right at it so water's flowing right at mm -hmm. the mop, a lot of times they will spawn right in that mop. It's easier to see the eggs than that's how I colony bred like the orange lasers and yes. everything. Yeah. You you would never see eggs on the glass, but you'd always see babies. And so there's infinite spawning mops and all that. And we basically just put so many mops and things in there that they're gonna spawn on something. Fish could barely find each other, and that right. made the babies be able to survive. Right. And so I think most often we see them lay on glass, but right. they that could be going on. Yeah. Another thing that we've done I've done in the past, not specific to that quarry, but do marbles on the bottom. Okay. So any that hatch are out of mm -hmm. adults. I mean, they're down in the marbles. You could also do it with like pea gravel. Yeah, or another tip would be the uh, bio egg, rings. Egg, or egg crate, you know, yep. something that they can't get down through. Mm -hmm. um, and you might see more babies. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see here. I skipped some, so I'm gonna 20 gallon tall optimized hang on back filter. What do all silver tip tetras on top and dwarf quarries and shrimp on bottom? What to do? Okay, what to do? All silver tip tetras on top, dwarf want, quarries on bottom. Want, want to? He wants all silver tips. I want top. to do that. How many of each? Okay, in the 20 gallon tank and dwarf quarries. So that's the small. Quarries. I feel like the shrimp. This is gonna get murdered. Like from the silver in, in, tip tetras. Yes. Like they're boisterous. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna eat the shrimp. Uh, they, they Even might, if they don't eat them, they're gonna torture them. Well, perhaps. yeah, they're gonna pull the tentacles off. Yeah. They're, they're gonna take them piece by piece. Um, maybe a mono shrimp, maybe a big one. Yeah, big ones. I, or you could do the fan feeder shrimp. That would work too, probably. Yeah, I would leave the shrimp out. Mm -hmm. And do 18 silver tri tips. Um, dwarf quarries is that the little ones, right? So yeah, do Abroses or Pygmaeus. Eight or ten of those mm -hmm. and, and one Pleco. Yeah. Uh, I think the shrimp you're asking for. If know, it was a, if it was like sub silver tip tetras for like cardinal tetras, I'd be like, yeah, that'll work. Yes, right. But right. the silver tips, so, if you haven't had them, they're just... They're pretty aggressive. They're super active, which is great, but yeah. they're super active and they kind of nip at things. Yes. And, yeah, they're, they're you know, nip. think of it like I wouldn't silver, put silver tip tips tetras. Like with angels because they're yeah. going to end up with The silver tip tetras are like a puppy. It's kind of like jumping up. It doesn't mean harm, but it's always like, ah, oh, that puppy's a lot. Or the cardinal tetras are like that eight year old dog that's always like, oh, yeah, it's mild mannered. Right. It sits down when it's right. supposed to. It's not chasing stuff. It's not jumping on you. Yeah, it's. You know, even though they're both dogs, like, okay, that, that young dog is a pain. So, 
You were caught up mostly. What, what about? I mean, oh, here's one. I'm not going to have the answer to that, but you will. The staghorn one. Yeah. Got bad staghorn allergy. Three weeks of easy carb and has not touched it. Siamese algae or won't eat it. Using easy green, flu ball 3.0, blue spectrums off, and a 20 long help. So first, know that a flu ball 3.0 on a 20 long is like living on the surface it's of the sun. Way too much light, yeah. So without knowing what plants, or if you're injecting CO2, or anything, like you may already have these settings. Right off the get-go in my brain, I'm thinking... 25% power on the Fluol 3.0, probably. I would even say less. Like, you, it's going to no, be a lot. Yeah, it's going to be a lot. So a lot what happens light. a lot of times, people will buy a great light, and then they'll grab like a couple of Anubias and a couple other random plants, and then they're giving it way too much light. If that if that is you, those plants, like 15 to 25% might be the correct amount of light. Yeah. But if you've got, you know, super high-end carpets going on, you're injecting CO2, maybe it's like 50 to 60% of that light. Yeah. Or raise that light up. You know, every four inches you go, it's half as much light against that substance. The only problem I find with raising the light up is I don't like that light coming out the top. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that either. I mean, unless you go back to the whole canopy thing. Right. But because um, I've thought about doing that on my 75 with the um, with the uh, Geopegas in it. Mm -hmm. Because I want it to light the whole background because I'm getting a bar on the background. Okay. Uh, unless I turn the light intensity all the way up, which I don't want. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't want that light coming out the front. So You uh, could try uh, Current makes those background light up things that everyone's yeah, using right I now. Yeah. I can't tell if I I can't tell if they're the coolest thing that's ever been made or, the or they're thing. so gimmicky that <laughs> yeah. I can't stand it. Yeah. Sometimes I see it and I'm like, wow, that's super right. cool. And other times I'm like, ah, that does not look natural at all. So I can't right. tell. And for me all my tanks are painted black on the back, so it's like Pretty a no-go for me. Well, you know, one of the, and, and Jimmy and I noticed this, okay, because that, that is the first tank that I've ever put it in the tank background on. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so when you photograph that tank, there's no glare. That makes sense. All the rest of my tanks have black backgrounds. Yeah. But you still get, because the glare you're getting is from shining off the back glass. Uh-huh. So what I... This has prompted me to think about how can I put a black background inside the tank so that it's I could, so you could that do that. it's not reflecting. You got to do the black ABS, the that, non, that, the matte, the matte color. Yeah, because yeah. one side's shiny, shiny and one's a matte finish, like a and, and just old, silicone it in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or like what they used to do back before Earth magnets got way too expensive is you just did the magnets. Like they used to be able to buy those backgrounds, and they would just and have magnets. Put them on the inside, yeah, yeah inside yeah. and outside. Yeah. But well, I'm going to be experimenting with that this summer. That's a good idea to get because it really makes photographing better. Yeah, a lot better. I mean, all the a lot of the well, all the smaller tanks in your fish room have the matten filter, so that yeah, so that takes care blocks of that. that glare right. anyway. Right. It's not bad. I, I'd never thought about getting rid of the glare that way. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's hop back to non-paid questions. I always feel yeah, bad yeah. only answering. Paid ones. Tips to prevent hair allergy. I think you're like the best person because you kill plants and you absolutely hate allergy. So what? How do you keep allergy at bay? Um, my lights are dimmed. I also I don't light the tanks for eight ten hours a day. They're lit generally from about six o'clock tonight till eleven o'clock, and that's when my 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 main viewing time is. Mm -hmm. um, that's when I get to work on the fish. Um, there is an overhead room light. It's, it's a, like one bulb though. It's one bulb and it's an LED. Um, but you know, the, the tanks that are off to the side of that bulb, mm -hmm. they get algae on the front really fast. Because that light is on from 5.30 in the morning, that's my first feeding, yeah. till 11 o'clock at night. Um, however, this summer I want to put that light on a timer also. You know what would be interesting to do? Part of that lighting testing we could do, we could take the PAR meter and see what kind of light it gets. Sideways. Yeah. Almost. Sideways right? from that up. Right. right. And then we could test the next row down and be and like, see. how low, much lower it's would that be? It's a lot lower. Yeah. I yeah. Can tell. I mean, just, so, just to know. Even for so, us. you know, I mean, in my case, it's just light intensity. Um, you know, I've, I've been in the wild twice now. Um, yeah, the Amazon is bright. But, you know, when we're in the jungle, those rivers aren't getting hit with 100% sunlight for very long each day. 
the sun's Most moving. of the time when we were when I was collecting, it was like Shady. you had to move with the sun because it's like 20 minutes later, yeah. it's 10 feet above right or in front of you on that right. river. Right. Because it would only come through the tree canopy, and then as the sun was moving, you, you're so moving. I mean, really, it might have only be getting like 100%. 10 minutes of 100 percent light a right. day. Right. I agree. Yeah. Um, in those it, areas, it is anyway. bright light, but it is very filtered. I think because without vegetable. without the sun rays coming in, I couldn't see anything. Like, you can't dark. even see that. You could you you just see the glimmer on the top. Yeah. 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 That's so. a good point. Ooh, maybe I should bring the par meter to Peru. Too much to carry. Maybe. Maybe. I, I am. I'm making a list maybe. longer and longer of what I should and shouldn't bring. So, and I'm trying to bring less. Any experience with the Madagascar beauty uh, Paratilapia ble Paratilapia bleakeri? I have experience. I don't. So Madagascar fish. Um, that's the scientific name, but I don't know why. So it's, they come in two forms, big spot and small spot. Um, sometimes they get called a starry night cichlid. But I can't think of the name I always think of that they get sold of. Uh, I'm going to Google it. Cause, Google it. We have cause I, yeah, exactly. Uh, they get starry night, but there's a, something there's else. another name. Yeah. Yeah. Paratilapia bleak. Paulini. That's what it is. Paulini. So, and they get, they go back and forth on whether it's one species or two species. There's big spot and small spot. Uh, I find them to be very con specific uh, aggression wise. So, if you have something where I learned this very young in the hobby, like a Jurapari, it's got all those spangles on it. Mortal enemy of Paulini that also sure. has spangles yeah. on it. So, yeah. that does not work. Um, but as far as being a finnick eater, definitely not. I found them just to be pigs, and that might be a sign you need to deworm them. You know, get some general cure or something like that going through there, or levamisole, whatever it is. Like clean them out a little bit. Yeah. But in general, let me, let me think of this as like a true statement. Like outside of me, well, no, not even that. Cichlids in general should eat like pigs unless they're sick. Because even right. I visited some discus farms now where they will seriously put down that food a it's lot in seconds. Yeah, yeah and I yeah, yeah, I attribute that to them to actually not having diseases. Well, I and and speaking of the deworming, don't just do it once. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, all the fish that I brought back from Peru, I think I did it a total of four times over the course of the first four months that we had this. Right. Um, so, because. Worm eggs hatch. Um, if you have fish with worms, they're going to poop out eggs and they're going to ingest those eggs. And the meds can't attack in the egg. Right. They can only attack after they're after they're hatched in the intestines or on so the bottom. Or when you're deworming, yeah. you know, uh, do it more. Oh, you know what? We're an hour in. It's time for a commercial, don't you think? Sure. Okay. So, <laughs> so. I brought this little fizzy for Corey to eat tonight. Oh, did you? <laughs> oh, you didn't know you were going to eat it, did you? Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, I've heard about these, but I've never tried them, uh, and I just got them. These are the new Sarah. Um, it's like, it's like an O-nip tab, but it's more I think algae. They're catfish XL. They're catfish XL or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're larger. Well, obviously, what three times, four times the size of the regular O-nips. I have. Here's the regular. There's O-nip. the regular O-nips. So, right? Yeah, so, quite a bit bigger. Yeah. Um, I think they're more algae based. Mm -hmm. So next time you see me, I will have tried these. Guppies go nuts for those. Guppies do? Yeah. What or about, bears. What do. about plecos? I've never had like, we don't have that many tanks at the store that have like a ton of plecos. Yeah, the I problem do. at the store is you put it in any tank, there's a billion like fish that go and that eat go it. Out, and right. so not necessarily do the plecos like flock to it. They, they come around it, but there's so many fish, they don't really get to it. Yeah. I have, I have a bunch of, in one of my trays, I have a bunch of baby um I don't know whether they're gold or the super red. Mm. I'm going to try these on. So that's enough for the commercial. Let's go on. <laughs> so try these. Let me know what you guys think. Yeah. Uh, someone's using API CO2 booster. Do I still use Easy Green? Yes. API yeah. CO2 it's booster different. is yeah. basically an algicide. It's not fertilizer. So, I mean, it technically is, but yeah. Uh, let's see. What about Debosii? They have happy tank mates. I wonder if you're talking about 
Tropius uh, Debosii yeah. or Debosii the puffer, which I've never kept. There's a puffer species that's Debosii that I've I've never right. even seen so in person. Uh, let's see here. Well, I do want to do. I want to do my commercial real quick. Okay. I, I we'll see if this GIF will play. Okay, good. If, if it'll okay. play, then we'll do it. Okay. Basically, I've through the power of analytics on YouTube, it has become very apparent. I do not harp on you guys enough to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification button if you want. Like that is becoming increasingly more important to YouTube. Basically, there's so many people making videos that if you're not willing to subscribe or hit that notification button, they're not serving the videos up because there's just so many. So what that means, what does this mean to the layman here that's right. sitting in chat? What it means is if me and Dean do a video about dimmers on a Stingray light, you're probably never going to see it because it won't know that you're into that. Right. And right. let's say Paul Cafaro or someone else releases the next viral video, it's going to go, oh, but fish people love this, show them that. Right. And that's assuming you're not subscribed with the notifications on to either one of us. Now, if you do subscribe and turn on notifications, it will heavily favor anything that you've subscribed to uh, unless we're doing hate speech or something like that right. where it's flagging right. like, nope, can't do that. Dean is nude. Can't show that. Right. So this little, this little graphic, hopefully, uh, will do it. Let's see. Okay. Ooh, it's working. So as you subscribe, it filters the videos, that red one would be us, and you get a notification on your phone. Now the big difference is YouTube has done a lot of uh, campaigning at this point for this, and that is notifications are 100% working, Right. all right? But the big difference is, is people, they subscribe and they hit the notification bell, and then on their phone, they have the app turned off to like never notify me. Right. And so yeah, you have to leave that on. And YouTube actually shows that stat now. They show this is how many people. So we have 53,000 people that have uh, hit the notification bell. Of that, like 12,000 people only actually get notifications. Right. So like 40,000 of the 50,000 basically will never get it because they have their app set to never get the notifications. And, but, but you can have the notifications on without having the sound on. Yes. It'll just pop up yep. on your screen. Yeah. So if you, you know, because a lot of people don't want that sound clicking on all the time. Yeah, and so I, I have it for very few creators. And that's the thing yeah. is I'm not saying only do it for me just because do it for the it's ones me. You like. But yeah. if you actually want to see that stuff, that's what it's there for. Yeah. And I have it all muted. So all it does, it shows up as one little bar that says like, hey, someone released a video and that's cool, right? And you can have it do it on your desktop and all that kind of stuff. But uh, want to get that information out there because even of the people that are doing it, four out of five of them will never get the notification, even though right. that, and those are also the people complaining, I never get my notifications. And that's because you're like, you turned it on, like maybe for Dean's channel, like, oh, if he ever releases a video, I want to know about it. But if you have it in the master of the app, never send me a never notification send me, that overrides anything you've ever done before. Right. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so if you guys do that, that'll help, you know, that obviously helps the channel. The more people that come and watch a video and release it, if you watch, you know, the entire thing, that helps. It's all these things that help, so, yeah. And just as the summer's here, your time is at a premium, it's harder than ever to get views, so, you know, right. I'll take any advantage we can get going. And that's, I only ask you to do it if you actually enjoy watching what we're doing. Also, it alerts you when the live stream is going on. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. That's where I, I, that's where I hear about half of the live streams. And I also found that I can listen to the live stream in my car without watching it. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's the same as listening to a podcast later, but... Yeah. Which uh, we do have the podcast and all that, right. too. So, right. you know, that's... I've been thinking about that a lot lately. My main goal is that actually people consume it. I don't really care how you consume it, whether it's a podcast, a live video next year. Like, the goal is get the information out. Hopefully right. people can find it and get some value out of it. Because if that's not going... You know, I, I should just be delivering pizza. Like, I just make more money that way. I could make the pizza. There we go. Now we're in business. <laughs> now we're in business. All right. Uh, detritus worms, how do you get rid of them? Do you ever really, if you have... I mean... I'm not even sure I want to get rid of them. You could chemically kill them all. I've got something in my... We tested something. It also kills all your snails and shrimp. Too. Yeah, that's the thing. You're going to kill yeah. You're gonna kill a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. If you have too many, just vacuum the gravel more often. Or cut back on food. Well, that... 
Like yeah. no matter what, like if you no take one wants away a to food back source, food. it stuff dies. You know, you just hope it's what you want to die first. Yeah. Um, I think you you leave. I'm them. not convinced they're bad. I don't think they are bad. I, you're you're going to have them no matter what. If yeah. you if you have substrate, I even think that if you have four billion of them, that's just telling you you're doing something wrong. Not, but I don't think they're yeah. necessarily bad. Right. Right. Yeah. You can get too many if you're not good on your maintenance. I think. You can get too many, but I still believe that is a reflection of your system kind of not being in balance. Right. So right. either A, cut down on food, or B, clean more, or C, get more predatory fish that would eat those. Right. Like, it just means you're kind of out of whack. Do you believe that they can also, I think they can also live in a sponge filter? Sure, why not? Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. I think they, so. like, it's very common in ponds and canister filters and that kind of stuff to have worms in there. Exactly. And that's just because, yeah. like, even in my ponds outside, we'll get, like, really big worms. Like, uh, aquatic worms. Yeah. 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 Like, really yeah. big worms going on. And I don't see it too often in, um, like, our hang-on backs. But I think it's because we service them too often. Yeah, like, a I pond so can go a whole, pond like, go a oh, time. yeah, it went yeah. all winter and then a couple of months. Right. So that might be five months where average hang-on back is, like, eh, maybe two. You're being lazy. So. Do you, do you, do you upload the podcast to YouTube? No. So. No. The podcast is the audio version of this only. Okay. So that it's we have an app. If you guys don't know, we actually have an aquarium co-op app that we pay money for every year. Um, it looks like like this right here. Big old aquarium co-op. Oh yeah, I got that. Yeah. I click on it. See, we even got our old logo and everything. I'm not rate, rating the app, but it will download the newest episodes. It has an alarm. It has all kinds of stuff and. You know, I do have a long-term goal. Maybe, maybe the merch person does that to make a app that is uh, a better source. Like, I would love it to be podcasts and our videos. That'd be a good. But idea. this app is kind of yeah. made through the podcasting service, and yeah. So, all right, for five bucks, first time watching the podcast, happy to see Dean on. Oh, there you can't, go. Can't fight that. There you go. Joe's got sponge pads put on top as underground filter then was going to put gravel on and plants on top of that is that a good idea or not i think you did that in the back I of have, the day right i have done that i've um, never done it um in the old days yes we would get the inch thick sponge very similar to the pads you sell were they yeah. that coarse or finer um a little bit finer but but they were i mean you know they weren't rated the same back then now they're sure. all PPMs or whatever. PPI, yeah. Uh, PPI, that's right. So, so we would take an undergravel filter, lay an inch thick sponge pad on it, and then put our gravel down. And the idea was we're boosting the amount of surface area for biological filtration. Yeah. Um, did it work? Yes. But we also planted plants back then. And where do you think the roots go? Yeah, right into that mat. Right into the mat. Yeah. So you pull a plant out, you pull the mat up. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it will give you more biological filtration, but is it more than putting just another inch of gravel? Yeah, that's, I don't think so. And and it's also more prone to plug up, and you can't gravel vacuum the sponge. Right. You literally have to break the tank down. I believe gravel has got an insane amount of bacteria. It's I, a huge, I, huge. I amount. mean, there's a lot of universities that only use. Gravel yeah. and an air stone. Right. And it only needs, like, they have to cover one half of the tank with one layer thick, and that will handle as many fish as they ever put in there. Well, and, and you know, okay, um, uh, Lucas, mm -hmm. air stone and gravel. He's even getting away from air stones now. Yeah. He's, he's, Just plants. In my opinion. Leave the air stone in. Yeah. So what I find happens a lot is you stumble onto something that's good, and you keep pushing it. I personally believe taking the air stone out, we've now pushed it so far, you'll start seeing some of the detrimental effects yeah, where probably air stone with no filtration and good substrate with plants is like, that's probably the pinnacle. Probably the pinnacle right. So, yeah. you know, we most people are way over here with like 75 canister filters. And now we've got Lucas way over here that's like, you know what? The next best thing is don't even put water in. Yeah. Can't, can't have bad <laughs> yeah. water if you don't have right. water. Exactly. You know, like you can go too far. Yeah. And I think he was... I think he's on that edge because I've talked to him off camera and he he's seen some things where he's like ah some species do really well without it some I think they might like it but maybe I just and the problem is we we can't know 
do they need the circulation from the air or did they actually need the oxygen from the air like from the airstone i think it's the oxygen exchange um and and believe me there's so many people in the hobby that believe you put an air stone in you're pumping oxygen in the water mm -hmm. you're not pumping any oxygen in the water i believe we are it's air you're just pumping well air. so yes there is oxygen in the air yeah but yes. but those bubbles are probably going so fast that they're not dissolving in the water you're getting the air where it's breaking at the surface that's where the oxygen is going so in. that is that is true except i believe some of it i believe if we were to set up a study which i haven't so i always want to set the record straight of this study i haven't done so don't act like it's, it's a known it, fact right, right. I believe if we took the same amount of air that we breathe and the same amount of CO2 and we put them each through a CO2 diffuser that we would get a lot of benefit out of the air that we were putting in. Yeah, but an air stone is not the same as a diffuser. It's not the same, but I also believe it is dissolving into the water, but we can't see it because it's such a big bubble. Yeah, you know, like on a CO two yeah, ladder, the time you can watch to, it, right? And the, you can get watch it get smaller, right? Right. right. But the way we use air stones, and like everyone's this way, like, oh, it's so cheap. You chuck one in, you're never going to be like, oh, wait, that bubble got one one hundred smaller, right? And we're pumping a billion bubbles a, a, an hour in there. So I, I do because all I know is I have ways to test oxygen, and when I put in air stones, it increases the amount of oxygen in the water. Yeah. Now you're going to go, well, breaks the surface. Yes. But if I take that air stone out, wait a few days, and then put a power head that's breaking the surface of the water, right. it adds less oxygen, even right. though it visually looks like it's breaking way more water. I don't think a, a power head like that, unless it's one where you have it injecting air. So I, I tested that also. I, I tested that, and in, I lost that footage. And so it's one of those things like, of course you lost that footage. You know, like, yeah, okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah I'm hiding this big thing here. My, my goal is to make a billion dollars off of the cheapest product in the aquarium industry, and that's an airstone. But uh, when I did that test, what I found was there was a difference in the amount of oxygen that would be in the water depending on how deep the power head was. So the Venturi, <coughs> if you put it all the way at the bottom and the bubbles had to travel all the way up the tank, that would hold more parts per million of oxygen than if you had it, let's say, one foot down in the water and it was mid-level and doing that. So in my mind... The bubble is getting smaller as it's going up. That was what so, I was that's thinking. That's the whole premise with the CO2. Right. You know. That being said, you do <coughs> change trajectory of the popping and that kind of stuff by moving it lower. All of a sudden, it's like it's probably sucking a little bit less air because right. there's more back pressure. So there's all these things that I think as a hobbyist, I'm actually never going to go down the rabbit hole and figure out. And it's all going to be, yeah, that's what I think's going on. But I do at least have a meter to test. And so that's why I would disagree Knowing that, like, I could be just as wrong, though, <laughs> until someone does more Study. studying than I'm doing. And right. same thing, like, to Lucas' credit, he's doing an insane amount of testing with 300 tanks that I'm never going to do because I'm way too lazy. And so anything that he shares, <coughs> I'm willing to listen and reflect mm -hmm. on because it is data. Whether I agree with it or not, it's data. It's like, data. 300 yeah. tanks in his water doing his thing do X. And so, yeah, I take that and I go, okay, let me study that. And I think he, he's, you know, on to something. And I believe in a few years we'll find he'll really know what he likes yeah. in his water. And then and that'll be worth something right. for sure. Right. You know, they're like, oh, yeah, this right here is a good thing. So, come on in. Not Katie. It's, ah. it's Jimmy and I'm going to say Kay. hi. Hey, hey Jimmy. How, How you doing, Dean? Good to meet you. Nice to meet this is the first time they're meeting. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Look at that. Look oh, wow. at this room now, going. guys. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's hot in here. Yes. It's, uh, it's feeling it's really cool it's now. 86. <laughs> it's 86 currently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I did see a question earlier. Are you going to Aquashella? Do you know yet? I'm working on it. I hope so. I was looking at the, buying a ticket just last night, actually. All right. So, and uh, Jimmy's flying me out. I'm going to stay in Ohio for the week before. We're going to raid his place. Oh, you didn't know that? I didn't know that. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to raid his place in Ohio. Okay. Before. I'm going to yeah. show him the tank. And All yeah. right. You guys yeah. go do that. We'll keep, right. keep yeah. on with right. the show. <laughs> uh, I have been in talks with the aquatic experience people. So far, it looks like I'll be giving a talk to uh, retailers. Oh, cool. And then yeah. they – I feel like she doesn't know 
the person I'm talking with, I, I have a feeling I have no idea who I am. Because I was like, you know, I travel kind of the world and give talks to, like, hobbyists too, right? And they're like, oh, do you? And I was like, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I've been known to do that once or yeah. twice. And so we're going to, I'm going to call her on Friday and be like, so do you right. want me to give a talk? Like, so I might be giving two talks to the uh, Aquatics France. And I, I believe I'll be giving two talks at Aquashella as well. But cool. haven't picked yeah. the topics yet. Um, I haven't even put the talks together yet. That's kind of, I always well, do that last minute. You topics, you couldn't pick the talk. Or, yeah, you know, yeah, so. I, but a lot of times I want to, you know, I like Q and A, but yeah. that's just me. Yeah, that's because I don't like yeah. to bore people with what they don't want to hear. So I think it'd be cool to have like a, a talk where it's um, a board, you know, put five people. Oh, up like there a panel and moderate it. Um, I think people get a lot of fun out of that. Yeah, the the problem I find with I've been on some panels before. Yeah, and but if you did it live. Well, so we weren't live on the internet, but we were, like, live in front of an audience. Okay, yeah, yeah. But yeah. you tend to get someone who, like, dominates the conversation or the audience wants to talk to one person. And then you're kind of making the other people irrelevant. So I think, yeah. like, when you watch it on TV, there's always, like, that moderator, the, right? Well, I think that person's moderator. super important. That's... And all the ones I've ever been a part of never had, like, the moderator right. part of it. Right, So the one person takes over, yeah. Yeah, I think that would be an enhancement that I haven't seen done yet, so... All right, experience with lamp eye tetras or bloodfin, yeah, bloodfin tetras eating plants. Eating plants? I've never seen Are you either sure one of those. Plants aren't dissolving. I mean, most most fish will pick at dying plants. Yeah, they will. Yeah, yeah, anything dead. I mean, he said he's dosing easy green and root tabs. And he's got medium light. Like that sounds like the recipe to make good cookies. Right. But you could still screw that up. Right. Um. I have make sure it's I'm, hard enough water and high enough pH. A lot yeah. of people forget that plants need the calcium too. Well, the Val in particular comes yeah. from Lake Tanganyika yeah. and Lake Malawi. Well, not Lake Malawi, but Lake Tanganyika. Yeah. And it's it's a hard water plant. Ooh, here we go. Frontosas and Panda Corridoras. I personally say it can be done, but I think you're only like every week goes by is another week you might just have corridors without eyes right I agree. like it can, I can, it can be done i've seen it done yeah. in stores i've seen it done in wholesalers i've also gone into wholesalers where like why is that a tank full of fish without eyes like because oh we they, mixed african cichlids with, with these corridoras right. and we didn't feed quite enough one day right so and it's a little bit too tasty and and most fish will do that even like it's very common to see koi do that to goldfish and that kind of stuff yes. they're not getting enough food they're like hey that eye is tasty well yeah and, and you're talking you know koi have the mouth to pick at those eyes yeah you know so and the other thing is if you're if you wait too long with that uh like that frontosa it's the same thing like goldfish they'll swallow them eventually and they just get stuck in the gill plates yeah. and you end up cutting it out and you end up having like you end up choosing which one lives or dies and then you're left with one that's damaged right so yeah. you know you, right. you you start with two fish and you end up with half a fish yeah. hoping you can nurse it back to you know three quarters of a fish right yeah so uh Heater for a 65 gallon tank, 200 watts. Keep so I, I've always been telling people what heater I would use, and I think as an educator, I have to switch what I say, and that is now I always want to say five watts per gallon as long as you don't need to move the temperature more than 10 degrees. That's right. Because there's we're getting way too many emails where they're like, I bought this heater that should have done it, by the way, I live in Minnesota, and I have a campfire on the other acre of my property, yeah. and my house is 26 degrees right now, right. and it's not keeping up. And it's like, well, right. yes, it's not designed. Yeah. I mean, heaters are kind of designed to move from, room, from your room temperature. Room temperature, uh, yeah. 10 degrees, assuming there's a top on it. Exactly. So yeah. a lot of people won't have a top. And they'll be like, I don't heat my house, so it's like 57 degrees. And yeah. they're trying to get to 85 for their discus. And it's like, well, we really need to, uh, you know, adjust that. And so that's where I'm trying to change mm -hmm. my mindset of 5 watts per gallon, assuming it's normal living temperatures, and there's a top on that aquarium. Yeah, and not having a top on it is like going out in the cold winter without a hat. Yeah, you lose most of your heat you that way. All your heat's going right out Yeah, to the top. So I, I feel like if I if I say that for the next couple of years, that wisdom will just become like, oh, yeah, I get it, instead right. of like, well, I bought the 200-watt, or the problem is someone will pull it off a shelf, 
it says it does a 55 it gallon says, tank. Yeah, I hate and that. they have a 55 gallon tank, but they have all these crazy parameters that weren't accounted for. Right. You know, and I, people also have it like where it's too close to their fireplace and that kind of stuff. Like there's a lot of yep. Yep. stuff that can go on there. But yeah, roughly, you know, if you do 65 gallons, I think that's what the tank size was, five watts. It's like 300 watts. You can yeah. get away with 200 watts or maybe no heater at all if you're in really tropical zone. True. Um, or if you keep your house at the same. I mean, yeah. I don't keep my house the same temperature. I turn it off at night. I keep mine Even pretty winter, warm. It pretty know, much never goes below 70 yeah. in my house, mine, ever. Mine will go down in the 60s at night. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, Justin says, you've taught us well what causes algae. My question is, what facet of tank balance do you tweak first? Light, fertilizer, feeding? It's got reoccur reoccurring blackbeard algae, eight hours of light, easy green, one milliliter per 10 gallons, moderate planted. First thing I do is turn off the lights. Um, and then there's some variables in there. It's like, okay, how much do you feed? How many fish are in the tank? How much natural fertilizers do you get? Mm -hmm. um, I would cut off the light and then cut down on the fertilizer. I think the problem is there's no simple answer. People always want the simple answer. There's and no so one answer. Let's, let's take this as a different thing. Like someone's very overweight, let's use me. Okay, I'm overweight. What's the first thing you do? Do you exercise or start eating right? And the answer is, well, you have to do both. You should do both. Like right, right. Like right. if I if I exercise a ton each day and I eat terribly, it will still not fix the problem. And vice versa, if I right. you know if I eat perfect but I never get out of this chair, that's not going to do it's it. It's not going to do it either. Right. And the other well, going along with that is let's just take my forty gallon breeder at home, his forty gallon breeder at home, and your forty gallon breeder at home. Mm-hmm. Every one of them might be experiencing the same thing due to different, right, different variables. Yeah, you can have two people that are overweight. One eats great but never exercises. The other one exercises a ton but eats terrible. Right, and the and other does overweight. both, and the, he still has the, right because they have a thyroid issue or right, something else. Something else, right? And so what I, I what I honestly feel like is going on with your particular tank is that uh, your lighting is at eight hours. I think that's a pretty constant. Make sure it's on a timer or being run by an app. Make right. sure that's constant. So the only, in my opinion, other thing to tweak would be the amount of easy green. Yep. Now, and maybe more plants. I would measure to see what is your nitrate level. If it's very high, you're too much easy green. If it's very low, not enough. It might be just right. And here's one of the problems is um, you can have algae and everything's just right, but it's not going to go away until you get something to eat it or you manually remove it. It does like blackbeard right. algae typically doesn't go away without something eating it or you manually removing it, even right. after you've tweaked everything back. Right. It'll stay there because it's thriving. So it's kind of like, you know, and we'll go back to humans again. Let's say I'm overweight for a very long time and five years from now, I'm now very skinny, very active, and I eat great. I might have done damage to my knees because I was overweight for so long. And no matter what I do, that's never going to get fixed until maybe we have to do a surgery or right. something like that. So right. even though now everything's great, the Still damage has kind of been done, and that algae can be that way sometimes. Yeah, I you know. So yeah, now that I'm fit, I wouldn't be making it worse. Right. But the damage is still there. And and I think you know, blackbeard algae, and also um, uh, the finely filamentous stuff. What's that? Like hornwort, or oh, uh, uh, string algae, or those, snake horn. Those yeah. tend to hang on longer than any of the others. Yeah. And they're and they're harder to eradicate. I think it's I think it's mostly because less things eat them. I agree. Like more yeah. snails and right. plecos and all right. that. Right. Don't really touch that type of algae. Right. Because I can't really get a good handle on it. Right. Yeah. What are my thoughts on easy green version with less nitrates for people with heavy bio loads? My thoughts from a marker standpoint is never. The minute we add more easy greens to the line, it no longer is easy. That's right. That's kind of the problem with like Seachem Flourish. Yeah. There's 10 different bottles. Which one do I buy? Right. None, none of that part is easy anymore. Yeah, I, I was actually just at a store. Well, I went um, when we were at the AGA. Uh huh. And I looked at them. And like, there is so many different sea chems. Mm -hmm. How would you know which one to buy? Yeah, if you were new to the hobby. Or... Oh, there's only one easy green. Right. So you from know? a marketing standpoint, that makes sense. Yeah, now, on the one with less nitrates, there is a segment of tanks that could possibly utilize that. But... It is the minority, and so I my counterpoint would be 
why don't we make it so that you're producing less nitrates in the tank? So maybe your load is very high, you can reduce it. That doesn't always mean taking fish out. It could mean feeding cleaner foods. True. You went from yeah. Wardley's flake food to frozen bloodworms, all of a sudden you might see a dramatic decrease in nitrates Probably. or phosphates and that type of stuff. Yeah. The other thing you can do is add more plants. True. You could also yeah. add more light. You know, if yeah. it gets way too out of balance, then yes, that is a problem. That being said, I think I, I've yet to ever run into any load ever that I couldn't just balance out around Easy Green. Now, yeah. obviously, my interest is to do that because I own the product and all that. But, um, but at the same time, you've also, you have a high interest in developing that product and making sure that it's working the way it should. Yes, and so, so in this exact example, this is, Seachem went the other way. They go, let's make it so right. it adds almost no nitrates so that people, because their goal when they developed the product, let's say 20 years ago, was how do we get someone with African cichlids or Oscars to start keeping some plants? Right. They already have high nitrates. We can't add more, right. right? Now the market's changed and their product hasn't changed. Yeah. So the answer could be maybe you just dose Easy Green in half amount and dose Seacom Fertilizer, like Flourish, at a half amount. And then you're... You know, assuming you've yeah. got enough nitrates. Now, that being said, I find most people, they have very high nitrates. And if I made a Easy Green with no nitrates in it, then your complaint would be like, how do I have one with less phosphates? Because you're probably not testing for phosphates and all these other right, things as well. Right. We all yeah. test for nitrates. Right. And so I end up getting into this rabbit hole of, oh, I've got 42 different fertilizers. What are you doing? Right. Which you one know? do I buy? Yeah. yeah. So I, I tend to go, okay, how do I serve... 80 plus percent of the market with one product and then from there how do i teach the people it's not serving to have it serving? to have it served right yeah right that's that's the, the the market plan if you will Well, and the whole premise of that is that first word easy mm -hmm. you know you the idea of that product is to make it easy for mm -hmm. everybody actually i got a flower yeah <laughs> on a plant so before uh, it died, before it died, it's still flowering. You didn't actually. buy it that way. I didn't buy it that okay. way, but I added Easy Green. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, to show first you, time ever <laughs> to show you how much fertilizer you use. He still has like some of the test. I think it's like a test bottle from the first time ever. It was, yeah. Ever. No, that one's, that one's actually like, gone now. It's wow. Gone now. Oh, you finally yeah. used that one up. It's gone. Yeah. Even though he's got an I entire fish room. room. <laughs> yeah, he's got an entire fish room. It took him four years to yeah. use up one bottle of Easy Green. Right. So. Uh, Mitch, no. Yeah, we won't. We Sorry. won't ship to the UK. You can uh, use a freight forwarding service. We don't have any good recommendations on who to use. We've actually been going through this lately. A lot of questions have been coming in. We don't warranty any product outside of the U.S. We only service the United States. And it's not that we think our products are any more going to fail outside the United States. It's that when it does fail, it's I have to really be able to hard. offer the customer service I would. And so if it failed, we reship at our cost. And if it's $112 to ship a light to Australia, right. like I can't carry a warranty. And yeah. then Fluval goes, well, here's another light. And it's like, yeah, but I'm out $112. You mm -hmm. know, so it's it's all on you. And I get that so far this system sucks and we are working on it. But there it's is things easy. where it's like, there are world powers at play here that are preventing well, easy logistics the, of this the, stuff. The whole logistics is so expensive to ship overseas. Even if you put shipping aside, yeah. you have a different plug adapter. You have right. different certifications. Right. You have different MSDS sheets. I have a list of countries and sheets we've submitted Easy Green MSDS to when we were shipping on Amazon. They're shipping worldwide. And we went round and round and round to get them into countries. And even then, sometimes they'd be like, yeah, it's fine, except we just still say no. <laughs> you know, And you're like, well, why did I go through all of this if you were just already going to say no then? Exactly. You know, and they're like, well, this is kind of a standard form. Right. You know, and yeah. so we, you know, we definitely have meetings about it on how we can launch, what we can do, and that kind of stuff. And it's slow and steady. We have meetings with DHL. We have meetings with uh, UPS. You know, we have, like right now, even from wholesalers, we have from Dennerlay a, a shipment that's been seized by customs. Wow. You know, and so there's a lot of money sitting there. And it's like yeah. they ship all the time in the United States, and yet this shipment is not. And you know, so if they ship 100 shipments a year to the United States and we ship 100 shipments a day outside of the United States, we're going to go, oh, that's going to be happening all the time. We're like yeah, yeah, having yeah. to prove things to customs. And even when people order through the 
freight forwarders, it's an inconvenience because they have to prove what they bought. They have all these extra requests. And we jump through as many hoops as we reasonably can. And then at some point we have to say no and people get super angry we're not willing to do it. And right. they're like, you don't get it. To go get an MSDS made for Algeria is yeah. a few hundred dollars to get it to the specifications for Algeria. It's right. not that it's not like, oh, I'm just gonna write it down on a post-it note and that's gonna pass for customs in no. Algeria. No, it's gotta be it's the document. legal documentation. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, we have to draw a line like, yeah, I get it, you know, but we don't think we're gonna recoup hundreds and hundreds of dollars out of some of these countries. You won't. Yeah, I don't yeah. think you will. Yeah. So and that's just for one product. Like, oh, you wanted Easy Iron and Easy Green? Now it's four hundred dollars. Right. Oh, you bought the whole trio? Like, oh, in the in the root tabs, like, and the carbon. Oh, that's a thousand dollars now to get it through customs uh, for a sixty dollar order. Yeah. You know, so. so we just have to say no, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. All right, where are we? Um, well, there was something else I wanted to talk about. Oh yeah, the sale we've got going on for Father's, Father's Day. Father's Day. Kind of a weirder sale I've never run before, but it's kind of like the buy more, save more sale. If you spend a hundred bucks, you can save five bucks. If you spend two hundred bucks, you can save twenty bucks. If you say if you spend three hundred bucks, you can save forty bucks. Yeah. And that's on anything you want to buy. It has to be all at once. And uh, you know, some people have been able to save a bunch of money on lighting and big plant orders and that kind of stuff. That's the way to do it. Buy your lights now. Yeah. Because that's the way to buy them for your dad. I, I realize that this hobby is actually very difficult to buy for someone else. It is. You know. But lights? You can buy gift cards. Lights work. Lights are pretty universal. Dads but always like new lights. I, I, I don't I don't think too many people would be sad if like, oh, dang, I got another 3.0. I was just yeah. going to say, two 3.0s. Yeah. <laughs> and then promise him um, a couple 75s on the next pet coat. I mean, the good news down, is so. if you did buy something like that and they really were like, I hate this. You can spend the the shipping and send it back to us. True. Like it, it'll cost you probably twenty five bucks to ship it back. Yeah, which that that lets you know how much it costs us to ship to you twenty five bucks. But right. um, I, I don't think most people would return a light because. But they yeah, it. because it, especially if you showed your dad the app. I mean, I, I was just talking to Corey about this app right before we came on the air because I haven't got mine completely set up. Um, but what I have set up is I can vary that spectrum so I'm not getting a huge amount of algae in mm -hmm. that tank there's no plants in that tank yeah so we're we're installing uh, a bunch at the at the warehouse and i'm trying to decide do i use the app or do i use the timer like a timer because i'm like I, what if i have a laundry list of these things like wait tank 26a you know like i'm thinking maybe i just go with a normal timer instead that's a hard one i mean i would i I would get uh, a big iPad and mount it to the wall. So we, we thought about that, yeah. And just le have it plugged into it uh, so it never runs out of battery. So I have it plugged I've in. essentially given like a an un unlimited amount of money to be spent on improving our plants. Like our, in my opinion, our plants are already the best on They're the market. They're really good. I was looking at them just today. I'm biased, but hey. <laughs> uh, but I'm willing to invest in iPad. So we, we already invested in all the return pumps are now DC pumps. We can custom calibrate every tank if we want. Yep. Um, we are going to install some Apex systems so we can be alerted if pH was to ever drop. There's some robots that will test all your water parameters and flush the system out with RO water and report those to you even every 30 minutes if you wanted or every day. We're thinking about investing in all that just because the more I travel and the more we expand our plant offerings and everything, we want to make sure that you know, it's not like, oh, you're in Israel for a week and we killed $4,000 worth of plants. You yeah, know, like, you don't wait, want what? That. Yeah. What happened? Yeah. You know, so, and uh, kind of Joel's in charge of that. So Corvus Oskin yeah. is in charge of kind of revitalizing. Or not, I don't want to say revitalizing, but like. Just perfecting. Yeah. It's, it's fine tuning. Because yeah. yeah. it ran a certain way when I was there all the time. Yeah. And there's that inherent, like, you know, the rose gardener knows that rose needs to trim right. it right now. Right. And now that there's more employees. And if someone forgets to mention, oh, I saw this, by the way, you know, I will say our system is so well dialed in for the plants that Robert told me uh, Siamese alligators spawn and we have fry in the tanks. Nice. So we have Siamese alligators nice. reproducing in our plant tank. Nice. So it's at yeah, least a little cool. uh, a little tip of the hat, if you will. Yeah. So, yeah. 
All right. Can too much beneficial bacteria turn into bad bacteria is a situation where a full carpet, hold on, where a full carpet will be housing so much bacteria? So we're probably talking about a carpet like of plants. That's what I would think. Like yeah. hair grass mm -hmm. or... Um, I'm not sure... I don't think that will happen. Yeah. Because even if you had a really big bacterial colony, let's say you had like a ton of fish. Right. And bacteria counts very high on all the surfaces. And then Dean comes and sells me all those fish. I don't think you experience any kind of a crash, right? No, it's going to die off. It, it, it will, will die it back. It will die back. Yeah, for sure. But it, but it won't crash. It doesn't create any it ammonia or anything. No. I think it's because as one bacteria dies, let's say it makes a molecule of ammonia. Right. All the rest of it just eats it. It eats it, right. And then yeah. it's like eventually another one starves and then they right. eat it. And so it like, it, it like comes down... I don't want to say slow because it can die very quick, but it's like a linear thing. Like it somehow, linear, like it can handle itself. And I, and I also think that you know, the way me and you are talking about a crash is when a tank. And we've all had tanks crash. Well, maybe we all haven't, but we've had tanks crash. Definitely. So we've seen that. Um, I don't think you're going to see that. It's going to crash be, besides the bacteria. There's going to be something else that goes wrong. I just don't think. I mean, remember when, when we're stepping in the mud and you get those great big bullets of sulfur mm -hmm. gas? Yeah. You know, um, that's all the wrong type of bacteria. Mm -hmm. But nature's taking care of it. And, it's, yeah. and, it's, and I, I don't think this is going to happen. I think inherently the question, I don't think you can have too much good bacteria. No. no. You know, no. if we really get, went down a rabbit hole and like, well, what about not good bacteria? And what about, you know... Yeah. There could be some corner case, but I think in the aquarium hobby, you know, like, it would be very hard to do. Possibly you could have a tank that had an insane bio load, you got rid of the fish, and then you managed to get rid of all the oxygen in that aquarium, and all the bacteria died at once. You could then make some ammonia, yeah, possibly? I, I have had that. Okay. Okay, so, so years ago, one of the trends was a reverse flow under gravel filter. Mm -hmm. So instead of pulling the dirt down through the gravel yep. and up through the lift tubes, you're going the opposite. You're going through the lift tubes, you're pumping it through the lift tubes, mm -hmm. under the gravel, so all of the debris is under the gravel, and there was no air stone in that tank, right? Um, this is a wife story also. Even like they should at least use Venturi. They're pumping it down. Yeah. There's like no reason so, not to. So we weren't, you know. I mean, yeah. I mean, this is this was one of my own experiments that I did. So I'm like, I've got power heads pushing the water down, um, thinking that all of the and this was in a discus tank. Uh, I think there was 12 adult discus in a 50 gallon tank. Uh, had this now the gravel had already been full of bacteria from running the other way. Oh, okay, so yeah. So all I'm doing is switching directions of the water right. flow through the gravel. And, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so that's the only thing that I did different is switch the flow. And I get a call from my wife yeah. <laughs> that all of the fish are gasping at the surface trying to jump out of the tank. And I'm like, okay, what has happened? So I've basically pumped all of the CO2 that would be in the gravel, all of that anaerobic bacteria is now into the water column. Or, and there's no air. Yeah, that's what I wonder, yeah. is it like, so you the, had the there's air no air exchange. In. Yeah. So, you know, I'm long distance out of town on the phone, I said, put an air stone in there. Yep. And within 10 minutes, the fish weren't gasping anymore. Yeah. So, yeah, so, but is that because I had not enough beneficial bacteria or see and that's where like the lucas bread system like of 300 tanks if you were doing all of it you could you could figure that right, out and now right. it's like well either a was because you switched from using an airstone or b it's because of that bacterial thing but the answer is you're never going to repeat it because that's too much work exactly and <laughs> exactly. to figure out like oh how yeah. about we just avoid right you know the problem so yeah yeah uh we've got a few new members i should highlight them quite a yeah few. uh we've got Joe, we've got Cam, we've got E Jazz, we've got Christian's Fish Room, we've got uh, Mitch, who was asking from the UK, right? And 
Yes. Is one up at the top. All yes, each. all each. So by becoming a member, you're donating like five bucks a month, and with that, we buy tacos or help get people to different events, that kind of stuff. Maybe Peru, maybe um, Aquashella. We give stuff away. You know, I don't, I don't want to pigeonhole it to anything because then sometimes I, I used to do that in the past. Like people, you didn't do that thing you said you were gonna do. Like, oh, I donated it to this thing. Right. Oh, how dare you? Like, oh well, yeah. it's all, it's all meant to go just towards good things and. What I tell people is, you're entrusting your money donation to me that I will put it somewhere I think is usable, whether it's to buy me uh, another bottle of water to have another guest, whether it's to buy a plane ticket, whether it's a piece of equipment, whether it's to keep Jimmy still editing for us. Like It's all put in a good moving forward direction. I can promise you it doesn't go to my bank account, or at least my wife can promise you that. Cause... It might be peanut butter cups. Yes, from Zenzo. <laughs> yeah. I do love peanut butter cups. So... Although I've been laying off the peanut butter cups because I'm, I've been training this week and basically it's go time for Peru. So even before you came, I hopped on the treadmill for half an hour and going up the hills. I have I have the treadmill that like you know plots that course for you. Like yeah. you need to start running up this hill now, uh, so I can be in better shape uh, for Peru. Just because it's, it's one thing to collect, it's another thing to haul a bunch of camera gear and keep it from getting destroyed and you know. Nets, like, buckets of fish. Yeah, yeah and so I want to make sure I can do like yeah. I did fine last time, but it, it's it's definitely harder to film and do all the work than it is to just do the normal. Like I'm just going to collect this. But okay, so last time, you know, we're, we're pretty much in the 70s and 80s degree temperature wise. Yeah. This time we're going to be in the 80s and 90s. All right, it'll be like in a live stream. 86 all, right all, now. Yeah, it is hot <laughs> in here, by the way, guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but it'll be night and day like that. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's you know there's like there was that day with wicked diarrhea. And I've already got my malaria pills, my diarrhea pills, and so right. the better the better like used to my body is like my plan is like last time after a couple weeks and I start putting backpacks on full of camera yep. gear just to, like start getting myself used to that you know because right. I some days are very long treks, some days aren't you know some days are relatively easy but I don't want to uh, you know. It comes across on camera if you're exhausted, and so oh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll be exhausted. Yeah, exhausted. and so the longer I can go without that, the better the footage is because right. you right. you eventually get to a point where you're like, do I want to hike up there and get this shot? Do I want to go do that? Like, could you redo that again, Dean? And you're yeah. just like, oh, we're exhausted. Yeah. So the more I can prep to uh, get through that, the better. So right. it's not just turn a camera on. Some some things you actually you know sometimes you start learning language sometimes you start doing other stuff right. like it's more than just show up and do a job right so yeah uh, will I be at Pet Fest in Arizona uh, I don't believe I'm going to make it to that one and it's it's my reasoning is it's only a one day event mm, that's tough and yeah. so the reason I say that is I've been turning down tons of clubs because it's only a one day event and it requires like two days of traveling plus I got to be there for a day. And so now I've accepted a couple of events, like uh, I'm speaking in, what, Costa Mesa, California in September. And so if I have the option of showing up to Pet Fest, which is more than just fish, or showing up to a club, with California being the largest demographic in the U.S. Yep. for me, yep. I should go there to see the most amount of people. It's not, it comes down to you can do thing A or B. And if I think, I believe more people get enjoyment out of watching me speak at a club than just shaking my hand at Pet Fest. Right. Because to the best of my knowledge, they don't have speaking engagements and that kind of stuff. Kind so of, yeah, I, don't know. Uh, I will choose to go and try and educate and do something a little more meaningful than just shake hands. Right. If right. it's all the same and uh, you know, I've still got some big projects going on that I can't talk about yet. And uh, so that's why my time is limited. So Yeah. Yeah, it's mostly convincing Dean to work for us. I spend all my time hatching yeah, out evil plans. All right. Joe, our new member, within 48 hours after using a Furan treatment, which is an antibiotic, right. uh, and a 25% water change, a 5-inch Pictus catfish started having what looks like seizures and then died within an hour of the seizures. What would I think? So, in general, I avoid furin, furin. and bifurin. Yeah, I don't, I don't use either. And they're, they're yeah. just typically... 
They're very strong, if I remember. They're right. a strong antibiotic, yeah. and the bifurin gets rid of both good bacteria and bad bacteria. Right. Now, and the Pictus cat doesn't have scales, if I remember right. Yes. So it's scaleless fish. Scaleless fish could be a little more sensitive to pH and that kind of stuff. Right. I honestly think an answer like this, it probably has. N I would wager probably has nothing to do with the medication. Right. And is actually probably uh, free ammonia from a water change or not having enough oxygen or a combination of a bunch of a different stresses. Like yeah. meds add a little stress. Right. Water change adds a little stress. You were using meds probably because it was already sick already. It could. That's what I was going to say. It could have been already too far gone by the time you got the meds in there. Or just like the last thing was like, oh, there's not quite enough oxygen. Now I'm in seizures. And now, yeah. you know, yeah. Pictus catfish in general should be kept in larger groups. The rambunctious. That was probably a stress factor. Big tank. Yeah. So, but there are a lot of uh, wholesale facilities that will just nuke everything with furin uh, and just like dip them real quick and that kind of stuff. And so inherently, I don't think that med by itself is deadly. No. I think no. whatever the group of circumstances going on proved to be deadly, but a lot of times, like when I get sick, I always think it had to have been that thing I ate or it had to be that country I was in or, oh, I knew it. I got on the airplane and that got me sick. Right. You know, but it turns out like, oh, I got sick from my wife or something. Like right. we, we jump to conclusions. So always get sick from someone rarely else. are we actually able to diagnose and like, oh, yeah. it was this. Well, and plus, you know, going back to a, a dip is different than a bath. Yeah. Different you know, than a 40-hour treatment. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of wholesalers will use a dip yeah. and then they won't do a bath. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot different. Um, yeah, so picked this catfish in this person's care, different person, died within four hours using ICEX medications. Right. Yes, yeah, so a lot of different meds can be very invasive. Right. Like, there's a reason why I'm so diehard on these are the meds I use and I've tested with Just thousands and thousands yeah. of different species and haven't had this reaction. And that's, you know, I always like to remind people with human medications or animal medications, there's vets and pharmacies going, don't put these meds together, it will kill. Right. Or this is not going to work. When it comes to fish, there's almost no one doing that. So it's no. very easy to go, oh, this yeah. plus this was a death sentence and no right. one knew the wiser. And so I always say it's not that other medications don't work. It's that I haven't run them in 4,000 different combinations to know which ones are toxic. Right. You know. I mean, I, I know not to do the... Um the dewormer with the with the trimeds. Oh, like the levamisole yeah, in addition. You do yeah. it afterwards. Right. You know? um, yep. And so. even even uh Robert ran into that lesson. He he was like, oh I'll just try to, you know, you we were, we had like an angelfish that had it and it just come in and we wanted to like, oh we can get it through faster if we just do them all. No, you can't. It's not and it didn't work. The three work together. Right. That's been proven. Uh, you're you're adding a fourth in there, and something's not working. And even right now, this is this is 100% transparency. I'm testing meds that we've had developed for Aquarium Co-op. They won't be sold under Aquarium Co-op, but we sold under the company that's making them. Uh, and even though they have the same active ingredients as the other meds we're used to using, we're thoroughly testing them to make sure that the non-active ingredients don't have any interaction with other meds we already currently use so that when I give the advice, I can say, we've been using it for a few months, hundreds of different species, it's working the exact same way as the other med. Right. And the result is at the end, when we do release this to the public, it'll be like, by the way, you guys get to save like 20% on the medication cost oh, at this oh, point. Right. And we are testing some other meds that aren't on the market yet, but we need to really make sure they're working as intended uh, before we turn them loose. You know, because really, right, right now we could be like, yep, you could buy it tomorrow. But when people ask me questions and did it kill this, will it do that? I have to be able like, well, I tested that. Or, oh, it, it does kill that. Right. So, it will kill that, yeah. You know, meds take a long, well, for me, take a long time. Because I really, I know that the wrong combination, I can kill tens of thousands of fish in a month. Right. Around the world. Right. By me giving a bad recommendation. Right. Exactly. So I, I try to thoroughly test. Here's a question for Dean. I'm looking... I'm looking for peat that will buffer my osmosis to lower pH than four. Do you have suggestions? Peat lower than four? 
Yeah, for pH. At that point, bacteria won't even survive. Bacteria won't. Under yeah. five won't. Under five it won't. Yeah, and uh, ammonia it becomes non-toxic under. Yeah, it's non-toxic. The yeah. the way who so I I've run into a couple people that do this. One uses rainwater, and then uses. So it's not even the peat itself, like the the it's, tannins. It's what you're it's starting. It's the rotting and it's stuff. It's the rotting. It's yeah. The so, the way I see it done at farms though, because I don't want to. Well, I'll, I'll give you this tidbit, knowing that there's a very cool fish farm coming. They don't run filtration on their neon tetra and cardinal tetra tanks, and they breed them commercially. Yeah. Uh, they keep the pH low enough so that the ammonia is non-toxic. That makes sense, yeah. And they adjust the pH using, I believe, it's citric acid. Well, citric acid is probably one of the best acids yeah. to use if you're going to use an acid. Um, peat alone, peat, peat will only take it down so far, but there's other tannins that will take it lower. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, but it's got it. You got to get it into that stage where it's actually rotting. Right. It's 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 not the just in the water. It's the that... rotting process that's going to lower it. Mm -hmm. um, Used to use um, um, filter bags full of that stuff, mm -hmm. so it kind of keeps it contained, right? Without all of the junk just getting sucked into your filter as it's rotting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but uh, lower than four, there's not a lot of fish that are even going to survive in that. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure. So I'm reading Aquarium Sunshine Valley. I feel like he's probably trying to spawn maybe a licorice gourami or something, something like, like that. that. And yeah. it, it gets difficult in that the answer is there is nothing easy under 6.0 pH. Right. Everything becomes difficult. And, and you're, you have to really watch for crashing. Yes. Really. A little bit goes a long way. There's usually not much yeah. buffer in the water at all. There's nothing taking care of any waste buildup. Right. The waste is building up. Right. Um, and it's, you know, something as easy as adding an air stone could shoot the pH up and kill your fish. Right. Like there's and, a lot well, of Well, that's the other thing, bringing on. your fish back out of that situation, you have to be really careful. Because yeah. you, you could very well kill them. So my official that. answer is, I don't have a, I don't have a, a good way to really buffer, because I myself have never wanted to intentionally take my pH below seven, honestly. Yeah. I mean, I have a few times, but generally... I would rather yeah. adapt the fish to my pH than try to move it down. Now that's that's different than using really soft water. Right. Because a lot of fish, it's more the softness of the water than the actual pH. Mm -hmm. So uh, so it's, diff it's two different things. This is a good question, at least I can answer. I don't know if you can. Uh, Kathy says, I read a scientific article saying, chemically speaking, only copper kills hydra. And bendazol and dewormers don't. Will plants survive a copper treatment? In general, copper is brutal on plants. It is. Brutal. It might not kill them, but it's brutal on it. Yeah. Now, without reading the article and getting too far into the weeds here, I 100% believe what you're saying because flubendazol, levamisole, those types of things. Even though we say it kills these types of parasites, it doesn't. It actually paralyzes. It them. paralyzes it. You can remove them, and and they stop reproducing. Right, or they get consumed by something. Yeah. So they get eaten, or they get broken down by yeah. another snail or something. Yeah. And so, like with finbendazole and levamisole, if you paralyze hydra and it can't sting stuff, all of a sudden it's a lot more likely the fish just eats it. Right. I've, I've had, and a lot of people blame hydra on feeding overfeeding baby brine shrimp. Mm -hmm. I overfeed baby brine shrimp every day. Uh, in the last. 10 years I've had hydro one time and I treated it with uh, the, the, the benzol or the dewormer. Sure. And it was gone the next day. I never saw it again. Hmm. But I guarantee you, and that was in actually in a shrimp tank. Right. I guarantee you that the shrimp, as soon as those stingers weren't out, just scarfed or killed it. It yeah. never, never came back and never saw it again. Um, if I would have put copper in there, all the shrimp would have been dead. For sure. Uh, copper is pretty harsh. Uh, See, now we're getting into that range of meds I'm testing. Yeah. Into like, oh, yeah. it's got to be safe for this stuff. Right. And, right. You know, because I, I do realize there's stuff that is dang near impossible to treat in the aquarium hobby. Yes. And we have to actually get there in a safe way. And for me, the med has to be plant safe, has to be invertebrate safe. 
and we have to get dosages, dosages down correctly. Right. And so a lot of testing is going and on. And is the dosage in water? Does it have to be in food? I mean, there's all sorts of that stuff. And there's a big difference you mean between fenbendazole and flubendazole. There will be a huge difference. And yeah. what you're using to make it the non-active ingredient so it can dissolve. Like, we've, we've got meds. We like the way they work, but we don't like the way they dissolve, so right. we try a different thing. Right. You know, it's a lot of hands-on, hmm, I yeah. think this would be better type of deal. What is the best food for bristlenose plecos, Dean? What's your best food? I got my best food. So if I'm being 100% honest, the best food, I believe, would be wood and algae. If I had unlimited amounts of that, and that's something you could technically grow yourself, if we go to a food that I would buy from a store and then feed, my best food that I would do... And it's only for bristlenose plecos. I would, if I was not lazy, I personally would make rapashi like every day. Would you? Okay. I disagree completely. I know you would. So my, I, I do agree with the wood and algae. Mm -hmm. Bristlenose plecos and common plecos mm -hmm. are the best algae eating plecos in the hobby. Okay. I mean... You could put them in an algae-coated tank, and in two days, the glass is clean, right? Uh, but if we want to talk about the best food that you can buy in a store, zucchini. Okay. Fresh, fresh yeah. zucchini. Um, yeah. Way better than cucumber, by the way. And I, I can't get mine to eat cucumber. A cucumber is, has a lot more water content. It gets all slimy. And it gets gross. all slimy and mushy. Yeah. Now... The same will happen to zucchini if it's not fresh. Yeah. Um, if you let that sit in your, in your – because I do this all the time. But okay, I'm going to feed zucchini this week, and I buy five of them. And then if I keep those till the next week, put them in the tank, they're going to fungus really fast. Right. So you want to go in your tank fresh. Make sure to wash the skin, uh, especially if you're not – even if you're buying organic, you want to wash it. But if you're not buying organic, um, wash the skin – um, because they use tons of pesticides on it. Yeah. Although I like to put the skin in with it because I tend it tends to hold together better. I only take like a strip or two of the skin off. I find sometimes and, and they don't get into it. Like, they'll come in from the end. Right. But if I take a couple skins off it, they'll eat it lengthways. All the way through. Way so you don't yeah. get plecos fighting at the end to get like to, to the inside. Fight, well, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so that's what I would do. Um, you know, algae tablets. They're good, um, but. But they're not the best. So if we go to outside a pet store, I actually prefer green beans out of the can. I don't. Way easier and faster. I think green beans generate way more roughage waste. Maybe. I haven't. Um, I like green beans. I'm not saying I don't like them, but and and I, green beans out of a can, are far easier than zucchini. Yeah, they already sink. You yeah, just, it's. You put the can back in the fridge. Right, even. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you use salted or unsalted? Uh, I use salted. I find that they don't take this unsalted as well. Hmm. They like the salt. I've never, well. I've always known that there's so little salt to the amount of water that we're about to dissolve it in, it's irrelevant. But that bean has absorbed tons of salt. Sure. If you taste an unsalted and a salted one, you can taste the salt. But yeah. fish also taste, I think. Yeah, to, I'm to sure some they degree. do. Yeah. And, and I have found that they eat the salted ones way better than the unsalted ones. I never went to the unsalted ones because they're always more expensive. They are more expensive and yeah. they taste cra crappy. You yeah. Them yourself. Well, because I always, <laughs> we always have green beans and so yeah. I can always go steal one out of the kitchen exactly. with my wife and be exactly. like, oh, I really got to, because yeah. I, I use them to feed turtles yep. and I'll use them to feed plecos. And in the store, we'll, we'll put like one green bean, green bean per tank just because we know we've got you know, a couple Shrimp, bristle snails, snails. Yeah, whatever. exactly. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes we want to harvest snails for the puffers and all that. Yep. Um, it's great. So yeah, yeah we buy them by the case even. And, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. It's it's after seven, so let's finish up some of these. Okay. Uh, we've got, what's the minimum number of autos to have in a group, Dean? Now that you're breeding them even. It depends on the size of the tank, but let's just say 10-gallon tank, three, 20-gallon tank, six. All right. Something like that. Should I be dosing Excel in addition to Easy Green? Uh, what I'll say is, as the inventor of Easy Green and consuming a ton of it, like in our warehouse filled with aquarium plants, we use 
no Excel or Easy Carbon even. Right. I only carry Easy Carbon because it is an best used as an allergicide. It is helpful to people, but I think it's better to manage your plants without it. And so, um, yeah. So I would say no. Don't have to use it. Could, but you don't have to. How big does a Pictus cat get? A Pictus cat? Like six, eight inches. Okay, so he's probably full grown. Got a four line Pictus. Some of those, like, some of those Pictus, there's multiple species, can get like 12 inches. But okay. the 75 gallon tank with his Oscar is currently about eight inches. How big do these guys get? Not a lot of info. Well, that's part of that ambiguity is yeah. there's a few species, some get a little bit larger. I think the bigger problem you have is they want to be in a group and they're rambunctious. So yeah. they like to be in a group at school. So my wisdom lands on if you're trying to do absolutely best by that fish, rehome it to a store and hopefully go to a, someone that's got a bunch of them. If you're just going, well, I'll play it by ear, then keep playing it by ear. When it's a right. problem, you'll know it. If you'll, it's not a problem, know. it's not. I doubt that the Pictus cat is going to hurt the Oscar. And I don't think it'll go the other way around either. The Pictus cats I think are pretty wild. They'll, they'll stay their way. So. All right. Uh, last one from Joe here. Who or where would you order a lot of 30 peacocks and half cichlids to stock an 80 gallon tank from? I was told the overstock to keep the aggression down is 30 enough. So 30 is enough. Um, if I was ordering today without researching the last place i ordered from and i was very very happy with their prices and the quality of fish would be i think they were tampa bay cichlids i've got my okay. pseudotropia solosi in there they were great price which for everyone freaking out i'm fully aware that pseudotropia solosi are not a hap or a peacock right right <laughs> but i'm just saying they carry those as well get, right right and i believe that they were shipped well the price was well i like that experience a lot and they're breeding them there. Yes. So that's that was my thing is I would get them from someone that is breeding them, so that you're not. Yeah, a lot of people would recommend Imperial population. Tropicals. I myself haven't ordered or visited there. Yeah. I know Mike seems like a great guy. I wouldn't say I wouldn't order from there, but I just have firsthand experience with other place, and I don't get paid or anything, and I I don't, I don't think they even know who I am. Um, but I had a good experience, and I'll always tell people about good experiences of like, hey, this yeah. worked out well for me. I would also look on Aquabid. I'm still a guy that loves Aquabid to find, you know, that backyard breeder that's like, oh, he's been, in his history, he's been selling these for 10 years. Yeah. You know, he's probably got it worked out after selling them online for 10 years. Right, right. Type of deal. Yeah. Um, you know, you might be able to find a local store. The biggest thing I'd be looking for is to find peacocks that haven't been juiced, you know, with hormones. Yes. Yeah. I can order them in, and a lot of people love to buy them, and they don't care. They're just like, I want the color. I want them to be cheap. I personally would be looking for them that aren't colored up yet from breeders and put your own group together that will look great two years from today and look great from then on forever yeah. than an insane amount of color tomorrow at two inches. Right. You shouldn't have that. Yeah. So they can be very cheap. You know, I, I think I can import them for about a dollar a piece. Yeah, that sounds right. And, yeah. you know, you sell them at four to five bucks a piece, but they lose their color and... You know, we, when we did it, we were fully transparent of like, just no, these, and the, most people just didn't care though. They'd be like, I don't well, care. Well, and you know, if they have been juiced, that, that it wears off. Yeah. And so they you know, lose their color. Right, right. And a lot of them, you can put so many hormones in the water that the females look like males. They, so you end up even buying yes. fish. You're like, oh, I thought I was buying all males or blah, yeah. blah, blah. Yeah. So it's, you know. You can go one way or another. They do it a lot with flower horns and all kinds of stuff, and you're either into it or not into it. And I feel like as a store, as long as they're being transparent and truthful, that's up to you whether you're like, oh, I'm into that or not into that. Yeah. And I, I would rather have the color come naturally from the foods that you feed. Yeah. Than, than It's a way better than situation chemical. long term. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Um, but, you know, the peacock half tank is kind of a, a thunderdome. And just in general... Usually people that are newer to African cichlids are attracted to that. And then if you become a hobbyist and do it for a long time, you start getting into like, oh, I want these two species together. Right. And then I'll make this tank together. Because you realize aggression's a little bit easier to manage and um, you can breed them. And yeah. Not that you couldn't breed those, you could. But that's just usually a normal progression. Eight out of ten people progress that way right? Like in that hobby. Yeah. So. All right, well, we've got lots of stuff to talk about between Dean and I. We've got plans to make. We've got food to eat. 
uh, and all that kind of stuff. And it's already after seven, so thanks for hanging out. Buy all of our stuff online so we can do more stuff. I'll see if I can get Dean back in here. You know, he's he's a loose cannon for the summer, so yeah. he's going to get more trouble. But buy that, the XL yep. catfish tabs. I like the size. You're probably promoing it. We have like three in stock or something. I don't even know. No, I think I took the last three. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's a great sales pitch. You can't buy any. I bought them all. Yeah, so uh, thanks for hanging out. We'll see you at the next convention. Dean is in California in July, early July, San Francisco right. and Sacramento. I won't be in California until... September, but we'll both be in Peru in August, and then I've got lots of other stuff going on. I'm trying to drag Dean with me, so there you go. More super chats, and we'll get there. Great.